Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, June 24th, 2018. This is episode 1500. Wow. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by LastPass. Secure every password protected entry point to your business with LastPass. Join the over 33,000 businesses and start managing and securing your company's passwords today at lastpass.com slash twit and by texture access the world's most popular magazines anytime anywhere using your smartphone or tablet go to texture.com slash twit to start your free trial today well hey hey hey! how are you today leo laporte here the tech guy time to talk computers computers <laughs> computers you know how long before computers sounds like kind of an old-fashioned word time to talk abacuses calculators computers the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, you know, really anything with a chip in it. And nowadays, when, I, when you're talking about computers, you're talking about probably not talking about a mainframe computer. Oh, they, they still exist. Those, those big old computers, you know, that take up a, the size of a room that banks still use them, still somewhat, <laughs> still used around the world. Uh, nor really are we these days talking about the, the desktop behemoths, the towers, although more than a few of us still have towers lurking here and there. Maybe we're talking about laptops or tablets, but the most prevalent computer by, I think it's almost an order of magnitude, an extra zero, is the smartphone. Apple claims to have a billion active iPhones or iOS devices mostly iPhones, bit one billion, and that's just Apple. There's probably uh, three billion or four billion out there. It's a huge number. And they're, every, they're ubiquitous in the sense that they're always in your pocket. They're wherever you are. Nowadays, you can't go to a restaurant without seeing a family sitting around the table all staring at their, their little five-inch screens. They're not talking to each other. <laughs> they're looking at... What's strange is uh, we're still talking, but we're just not talking to each other. We're talking to, you know, our our friends on Snapchat or looking at pictures on Instagram or seeing what uh, Aunt Myrtle's up to on Facebook. It's as if the people who aren't with us are more important than the people who are with us. It's strange. It's a strange phenomenon. And I think it has something to do with the fact that the people we're with, you know, aren't quite as vivid and colorful as the images on the screen, are they? They're not quite as stimulating. They're not quite as attractive and engaging. And that's not, a, that's not an accident. That's actually uh, exactly how it is designed on these, on these phones. It's designed to grab our little monkey minds, to, to look and, and feel, and it would smell and taste, if it could, like something incredibly fascinating. Because... Well, of computers. It does go back to computers. Because the people who design Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and... Well, really, could stop at Facebook. The people who designed these tools, uh, they're not evil. They're not bad people. But they understand that the, you know, their business, their job is to get us to spend more time, more screen time. They call it engagement. Attention. Attention on what we're... On what, you know their stuff, their product, they're, they're designed to maximize that. And that's, that turns out to be a fairly easy thing to do. Often in, in technology, the thing that is easiest to do is most likely to get done. One of the reasons in computer games, for instance, that we shoot things, <laughs> that it's all about shooting things, uh, is because in the earliest hardware, which had very, you know, significant limitations in terms of amount of memory and processor speed and all that. One thing they could do very well is something called collision detection. One thing hitting another. They had that built into hardware in the early Commodores and Ataris. That was an easy thing to do. 
It didn't take up a lot of memory or programming time, so programmers did it. In fact, you may, may remember the, the earliest computer games. Pong, right? A paddle and a ball, the ball striking the paddle. Bunk, 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 bunk. That was an easy thing to do. Then there was breakout. And as time went by, it turned out, hey, you know what? You could also use this to shoot things. <laughs> And then Duck Hunt, and then Doom and Quake. And those turned out to be horrifically successful. The initial feedback loop, though, to this was uh, was e-commerce, was the market. Oh, we sold a lot of that. Let's do more of those. But that's slow. That takes time. You way a year later, you go, oh, we should make that movie again. It turned out pretty well. In a way, that kind of taking time was a good thing because it slowed down... It's taken, uh, over time, we've, we've gotten better at making engaging games, engaging movies and books and TV shows because we've got that feedback loop. But it's slow. It was a slow loop. It took us, uh, you know, a decade or two or three to figure out that what really people wanted to watch was a bunch of people fighting and falling in love in a house, <laughs> which I think is like all TV shows. It took us a while to... <laughs> Oh, they tried it with I Love Lucy. It worked. And the and then the honeymooners, that worked. Hey, maybe. But that uh, that feedback loop is a lot faster now, right? Facebook knows exactly how much time you spend on Facebook and, more importantly, what you look at and how much time you spend looking at each article. So it's a trivial, it's an easy thing to do. And again, remember, computers, we tend to do the things that are easiest first. Easy thing to do to measure that and then optimize for it. That's a word computer scientists love. We're going to optimize for this. That means we're going to we're going to do what we need to do to make that engagement time that longer, that amount of time you spend looking at it longer. And that means they don't really need to guess really what's attractive. They just do something and this is another thing that uh, the modern uh, computer scientist loves. A, it's something called AB testing. And it's being done to us all the time. You don't know it. In the, uh, the the first early examples of A/B testing were a magazine that would try two different covers or three or four and see which one sells the best. Again, takes a while. You got to wait. Got to get the sales figures. Okay, hmm. they like that picture better than that picture. We should put more of that picture on our covers. Well, now it is you know it's instantaneous. The data gathering is multi-dimensional. They know all sorts of stuff. Where you, where you, <laughs> they don't know where your eyes are yet, although they do do eye tracking studies, but they can't tell that about everybody. But they can certainly tell where your mouse is, where your finger is, where you touch, and they can optimize for that. And they do A-B testing. Does this, in fact, uh, we, we learned uh, in interviews with political campaigns, particularly with the Trump campaign, that they would try different colors on the ads to see which ones got the best response. And in terms of response, it's easy to measure. How long do you spend on that page? Whether you shared it, whether you liked it, you know. We, we're complicit in this because we love it. We love clicking the like button, right? The thumbs up button, sharing it with friends. <laughs> we're, giving, we're giving them all the information they need to say, hmm, they like purple. It's often said that Facebook is blue. That's its predominant color because Mark Zuckerberg is uh, colorblind. But don't kid yourself. Mark doesn't need to know what color Facebook is. He doesn't even, from from his point of view, it's probably pound sign CCF three o two. That's a that's a color in, in web jargon. <laughs> uh, because he's tried CCF three o one, and that didn't work as well as o two. But o three was maybe a little bit better, and they keep doing it until they get just the right color to keep your eyeballs on that, glued on that page as long as possible. So that feedback loop is instantaneous, can be modified rapidly, easily, and uh, in an ongoing way to make it more and more attractive. So it's really no accident. It's not our fault that we spend this much time looking at the screen instead of those boring people like your family sitting across from you at the table because the screen is a vast psychological experiment. On every minute of the time you're using it, it's an experiment on you to see what you, what your monkey mind, our monkey minds, is most interested in, and then optimizing for that. Because after all, that's profit, and profit is good. So I wish I could do that in radio.
We don't have that feedback loop. Magazines, books, TV shows. The feedback loop is slower. It's pretty fast now on TV because they've got people meters and stuff. But it's still slower than Facebook. It's easy. Instantaneous and constant. And after now 10 years of doing that, mm, boom, 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 boom. They really know how to get you. They know what you want. Ah, 8888 Ask Leo. It's good for us to be aware of it. If we're going to be, a, a you know, a guinea pigs, it's good for us to know. I mean, doesn't mean we're not guinea pigs anymore, but it's good for you to know. <laughs> you to know. And maybe you could, you know, consider that and maybe try to break the loop, the cycle somehow. Our show, we're going to take calls in just a second. I didn't, did I mention 8888? I didn't. 8888 Ask Leo. That's the phone number. So give us a ring. 888-827-5536. That's toll free from the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area. Still toll free if you use Skype out or something like that. There is a website where everything we talk about will be uh, registered, noted by James DeRuvo. He's scribbling right now. That's techguylabs.com. That's all you need to remember. Tech guy that's me i'm the tech guy labs that's where i do my experiments dot com and that's free there's no sign up and everything's there so you don't have to write anything down you don't have to shout at me either you can leave your comments there as well 8888 ask leo we'll go to the phones in just a second awesome. kim schaffer is here for our 1500th show hello kim 1500 shows 4500 hours yeah i'm <laughs> it, it, according to malcolm gladwell who says you need 10,000 hours yep. of practice to be an expert I'm, I'm halfway there you're almost an expert <laughs> and just another 14 well, and a half years. i have been doing this before i did do this before i did this show yes. so really this is i don't know i hate I, you know it'd be interesting to count up how many radio shows i've done since i started and do you want to know when i started before you were born 1976 a couple of years yeah Yep. Yeah. Just a couple. Yeah. I've been doing this longer <laughs> than you've been alive. Is that crazy? It's crazy. I still feel like I'm your time. age. I feel like I'm 20. Yeah, I feel like I'm 20. <laughs> Who doesn't? We all do, right? We all do. Yeah. So Kim is uh, Kim Schaffer is here. She's answering the phones and getting you on the air, preparing you for your appearance on show 1500. You don't have to wear black tie, but it would help. A gown. Champagne. Champagne. <laughs> a candelabra. Hat. A monocle? A mo well, you have one of those. I do. I have a top hat and, and monocle. monocle. Should I, I should be you, wearing that. You should don it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on for the next uh, break. <laughs> I'll save it for 2000 Okay. Who should I start with? Uh, how about John in Encinitas? I guess his Windows 10 is showing that it's up to date, but he claims it's actually not. It's not up it's to not date. not up to date. Oh, my. Thank you, Kim. Hello, Leo. Hi, John. Hi. Uh, I'll get right to the point. I'm concerned that people are thinking that their Windows 10 PC is current on its updates when that might not really be the case. Tell me what's happening. Okay. What's happening is that after several hours of trying to install the 1803 update, um, you see a fleeting message about returning to a previous right. store point. Right. And when you check the update, when you check update windows, you see a misleading green check mark and text that you're up to date. But then when you check the update history, you see that, in fact, you're in a previous update. You know, it, it, it kind of reminds me of, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, the Star Trek Next Generation episode where the crew was trapped in a causality loop. <laughs> you remember that? Part of this is Microsoft's fault in, in not being clearer about what it means by an update. So let me, it is actually, believe it or not, this will make sense. But you have to understand what 1803 is versus what Microsoft's talking about with that green checkbox. 1803 is what Microsoft calls a feature update. The last one was 1709. Uh, in fact, if you, you can kind of figure out what they mean because the first two digits are the year, 18, right. and the last two digits are the month, 03. They didn't get it out till 05, but they didn't rename it. So 1803 is the spring update, and it's a feature update. When you get a big number like that, that's a feature. And this is confusing because in the old days, you know, it would be Windows uh, 95 System Pack 3 or it would be Windows 3.11. There would be a clear indication of what you of a feature update. And this time, because Windows 10 is the final version of Windows ever, according to Microsoft, you're not going to get those anymore. You're just going to get these two or three times a year feature updates. You are up to date. Your green checkbox mark means... You're up to date with the thing that matters, which is critical system updates. Secure, think of it as security patches. Really? Yeah. Wow. So you're not, it's not that you're insecure or that you're at risk. It means, 
and you're seeing this, there's something about your computer that, and you should, by the way, thank your lucky stars. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about your computer that is that Microsoft has said, eh, we better, it's not working. We're going to roll it back. And that's good. We've seen 1803 was pushed out by Microsoft. More than half of Windows users already have it. And if you don't have it yet, you will get it this week. And they pushed it out way too fast. Microsoft says there's nothing wrong, but everybody else <laughs> says, no, there's something wrong. Lots of people are having problems with 1803. So I wouldn't be in a hurry. And the fact that your machine spit it back out yes. <laughs> means, you you know, there is something that you don't want. And that's fine because you are because that green check mark is what matters. That means you're secure. You're up to date with critical updates. Uh -huh. You're just not up to date with feature updates. And there's really not much in 1803 that you're missing. There's the new timeline feature, which is useful, but not critical, I guess. Well, well, I, you know, I, I listen to Steve Gibson, uh, fascinating every week, and he met, he mentioned how critical the 18, um, 1806 uh, updates are, and I don't see any indication that those have been installed. No, don't. Okay, so first of all, remember, Steve just stopped using Windows XP. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so with all, and he refuses to use Windows 10, so with all due respect, he doesn't really know what's going on with Windows 10. There was a big Patch Tuesday update. The second Tuesday of every month, they do a big update. Right. You have a green check mark. You have all the ones you need. You're good. Even though that doesn't show up in the history. Yeah, what you don't have is 1803. That's not important. Well, the green well, check mark means you're up to date with critical updates. And you can you can do, you know, rerun updates and see if you want. Well, I try it many times. Many yeah. times. I think that you should just uh, be actually thrilled <laughs> that uh, that your machine went, it spit it back up. It regurgitated 1803 because something didn't work. Now, if you really want to get 1803, I would wait. I would just say, you know, every once in a while, it'll try to update and see what happens. And if it does, okay. good. But okay. but if you have that green check mark, you have the security patches. Okay. And that's all you need to worry about. You don't, what you're missing is timeline is the biggest feature update. There's some other under the hood feature updates. Nothing that puts you at risk if you don't have it. And, and you know, it is confusing because you hear me say this. The most important thing you can do to stay safe, keep Windows updated, keep your browsers updated, anything that goes online, keep it updated. In fact, all your software should always be regularly updated. So you're saying, well, I'm not getting updated. You are. You're fine. What you're not getting is the shiny new. In the old days, they might have called it a service pack. It's a feature up, but see, even that's not fair because service packs did do major security upgrades. 1803 is not about security upgrades. It is a feature update and timeline is nice. Let's you go kind of look back in time at things you've done, documents you've opened and so forth, but far from vital. In fact, a lot of people just don't even know it's there. Be happy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I don't think uh, 1803 will blow your ship up, although a lot of people have complained about this update to Windows. And, uh, you know, Microsoft does something that I, I really applaud, I commend. They do uh, big public beta testing. Apple's doing it now, too, because it's such a good idea, where they, where they say, look, uh, if you want to get the latest version, the new version of Windows before everybody else does, Microsoft says, join the insider ring. You can be a Windows insider. And you can see it. Now, I think Microsoft needs to do a little bit of a better job explaining what the responsibilities of an insider are. Historically, bug testing, sometimes they call it beta testing because the, the beta version of a product is a pre-release version. Historically, if you're a bug tester, a beta tester of software, you actually have a job. It's not just, oh, cool, I get to see the new stuff before anybody else does. And that's kind of what the insider program implies. Really, as a beta tester, your responsibility is to try to find bugs. Because there are bugs. There are problems. And and it, your job is to, to not only figure them out or to make them surface, but to keep a careful record of what caused it and then, most importantly, report it. Apple does the same thing. They actually, when you install a public beta of the new operating system, whether it's iOS or macOS, 
they install a feedback program and they put an icon right there on the desktop for the feedback program to remind you that part of your job as a pre-release tester is to f is to not only find bugs but to report them. And I'm, I'm feeling like even though Microsoft literally has millions of people pre-release testing these versions of Windows, they're not getting the information back they need. Very famously, a couple of updates ago, uh, the Windows update they pushed out, you know, one of the big feature updates, broke the camera on many computers, including Microsoft's own. You know, the, the video cameras built in that made them not work. And then it, uh, it, if you had a Kindle and you plugged it into your Windows machine, it crashed the whole machine. Just by plugging it in, that that sh those two sh things at least the camera thing should have been found and reported, and Microsoft should have known about it before they shipped it. For some somehow they didn't. Last couple of updates have been pretty clean, but this one, eighteen oh three, the one that's going out now, and if you don't have it yet, you're on Windows ten, you will have it because uh, it is now uh, gone. What they say, go call it gone wide. It's everybody's getting it. It's being pushed to everybody. Uh, and I think prematurely. And I think that there are kind of significant problems that people, including one of the things people are seeing, uh, blue screens uh, of death crashes during the install, which is very scary. That can mean sometimes that the install trashes your system. You know, a blue screen during the install can leave your system in a very precarious state. So those these are not good. These are significant flaws. Microsoft to this day does not acknowledge them. But people who are covering Windows say it's it's surprisingly widespread. Unfortunately, the way it works now with Windows 10, remember we all got that for free, you know, the free upgrade from Windows 7? Part of the deal was you have to do updates. You cannot refuse updates. You can defer them. And how long you can defer them will depend on which version of Windows you have. There's a sneaky trick, though, and if you don't have 1803 yet and you're not in a hurry to get Timeline or one of, one of the other kind of mind, there's some cosmetic updates as well. If you're not in a hurry, which probably you're not, one of the ways to defer it is to say that you're on a metered connection. This is a really silly workaround, but if you tell, you open your network settings and you say, this is a metered connection. In other words, they, I pay for the bandwidth. Most of us have unlimited bandwidth, but lie. Say, I pay for the bandwidth. Microsoft will then not download the update and automatically apply it. I don't know how long that will work for. Quite reasonably, Microsoft wants everybody to update because uh, that keeps the ecosystem healthy. You know, fixes significant flaws that could cause problems in the Windows world, which could cause problems in the world at large. So they want, it, they want that fixed. So update if you if update if you can, if you're worried or you just you know you you're not sure you can say defer the update or say I have a metered connection in your network settings and that'll put it off. Eighty eight eighty eight ask Leo. That's the phone number eight 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 two seven five five three six. Heidi's next. Santa. Mo <laughs> She's running to the phone from Santa Monica. What me? Yeah, hi Heidi. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for hanging on. Yes. Hi, I was here. Thank you, Leo, for taking my call. I have um, two quick questions. You had mentioned routers, uh, and I wanted to make sure that one of the routers I purchased would be um, up to date. I bought a Nighthawk AC1900. Love it. I had an Eris. So that's a good one in terms of uh, trying to deal with the issue with the happy Russian bin. Oh, <laughs> well, I do think those some of those Netgears were vulnerable <laughs> to what we call VPN filter. But uh, Netgear has been pretty good, I think, about updating. So the thing to do is to go into your router settings. Do you know how to do that? Yeah, I bought a brand new one. I had an Eris, but it wasn't. It was a few years old, and I couldn't get any firmware updates. So yes. that's why I thought I better. Oh, no, you're smart. You know what you're looking for. Okay. So yeah, Heidi, okay. you want to make sure you're on the latest firmware. Okay. And I okay. think nowadays um, these newer routers, I'm pretty sure Netgear will do this. Will automatically update. You really that's okay. That's the key is because you can't be bothered to always check. You don't know when there's a problem. Right. So, well, and I wanted, I had the Aero, but we live in a four story townhome with a lot of rebar, so I couldn't get the Aero to work. Oh, really? The Aero wouldn't work for you? No. So even does, one level down. Oh, that's a shame. So, what are you going to do with the Nighthawk? Well, I had the Aris, and I used extenders. Believe okay. it or not, that were neck gear yeah. and it worked. I mean, very rarely do we have an issue. Maybe it would slow down a little bit, but okay. for the most part, it worked. Okay. The other thing you can uh, look into, and for people who are in this kind of situation, 
Rebar, of course, metal in the in the floors and the ceilings and the walls will block Wi-Fi pretty pretty effectively. So one of the things you could do is something called power line networking. And I would look into this if you if 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 you can't if you're having problems still if if it's working no nothing to worry about if your extenders work fine. But uh, power line networking you'll plug in uh, at wherever your cable modem is you'll plug in one of these and then plug the plug a, an Ethernet cable into that and then above next stair above plug in another one and that can either be a Wi-Fi router or it can be a hardware device and then you can go all the way upstairs but again and plug in another one TP link makes these power line a lot of companies do but I like TP links they're cheap power line networking and what that does is it uses your power lines your grid to like an Ethernet cable get the internet upstairs and so if we can't That's go through great. the walls those things work very well thank you I will look into that do you have time for one quick quick question yep one more Yep. Thank you. So, um, and forgive me, you might have mentioned this in a previous show, and I was probably traveling and missed it. When is the best time to buy a new iMac? I have an oh. um, iMac, that's like a 2012. <laughs> that is a, such a good question. Uh, no <laughs> one knows. And, uh, oh. gosh, we were all very hopeful that th this past WWDC a couple of weeks ago, Apple might have announced new hardware. They didn't. Uh, and it's completely oh. unclear, and there's some significant concern that I share that Apple no longer cares very much about Macintosh. They haven't updated the Mac Pro since 2013. They haven't updated the Mac Mini since 2012. They're very oh, wow. slow to update the laptops. The, the iMac was updated last year with the iMac Pro, but that starts at $5,000. I know. Yeah. And it's now out of date. So uh, I would, boy, you have a 2012, if you can make it limp along, is it working still? It's beach balling a lot. Uh, I had a friend of mine trade out the um Replace the, the hard drive, drive and that still didn't fix ago. it? And it didn't fix it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you if, need a new one. If I have a lot of tabs open. I mean, I increased RAM. I've done things along the way because I stupidly bought it's worth, a Fusion drive. Uh, yeah, it's worth trying to keep it up to date. But yeah, it is time for a new one. Cross your fingers this fall. They've got to. They've got to. Uh, Apple has really started to worry me with the Macintosh. They deny it, but I'm worried. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't, it's meaningless because no one knows anything, and Apple is not. With the iPhone and the iPad, Apple's fair. Well, certainly with the iPhone, they're very consistent every year. With the iPad, they're, it's a little unknown. But with Mac, it's completely unknown. They're literally selling a 2013 Mac Pro as new now, today. And no one should buy that thing. It's terrible. Uh, the iMac Pro is very good. I have it. I love it. But it's $5,000 to start. Uh... <laughs> Sigh. I'm I'm using a 2015 uh, MacBook Pro because I that's the last generation of MacBook Pro with the original the older keyboards and I can I will not go to the new keyboard and uh, I'm worried. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, I'm looking on Apple's uh, store site and uh, under the iMac they say new new iMac the five K new, but they're using a processor that came out uh, KB Lake, which is relatively new, came out in. Uh, well, January of last year, so it's only a year and a half old. It probably is fine. It's probably fine. I mean, if you want, if you need to get a new iMac, I think you. I understand the concern is, oh, I don't want to buy an iMac and then have them announce in three months, have them announce a new one. And who knows? I just, you just don't know. And Apple's not consistent at all in the releases of the Macs. Very consistent with the iPhone. Every year in September, there's a new iPhone. A little bit less consistent with iPads. They try to get a new one out every year. <laughs> Completely inconsistent with Macintosh. No idea. There's no way to predict <laughs> what Apple's up to. They finally admitted, thank goodness, just uh, Friday, that they, oh, yeah, those keyboards, eh, maybe there are uh, some problems. Apple's facing three class action lawsuits over the keyboards in their MacBooks and the MacBook Pro, the Butterfly key, you know, they were so excited about these new butterfly keys. Uh, people are having all sorts of problems with stuttering, repetition. They're basically unfixable. 
Apple has acknowledged now that, um, yeah, there's a problem. <clears throat> we will fix it for you for free. If you paid for a repair in the past, we will refund your payments. Um, we admit it. There's an issue. Unresponsive or sticky keyboard problems. The MacBooks that came out, those little thin, lightweight ones that started in early 2015, 2016, 2017, those are eligible. So are MacBook Pros from 2016 and 2017. You can check and see, of course, and uh, they will they will repair them if you have an issue. If it's fine, and you know, my wife has several MacBooks. She loves the little thin MacBook, hasn't had any problems. I briefly had a couple of these, uh, which I got rid of, not because of problems, just because I don't like them. There, there's a, and this is just personal. There's an issue with key pressing, right? If, a lot of newer keyboards, they don't have much what we call travel. They don't move much. And I like a little more travel in my keyboards. I want, I want to know that I hit the key. I also want a soft landing. You know, when it does hit bottom, it shouldn't stub my finger. The MacBooks, the MacBook Pros, Apple's latest keyboards, not only have very, you know, just a millimeter and a half travel, but they have a, they hit hard. <laughs> and I just find it painful and, and, and most importantly, inaccurate to use them. So that's just me, though. And uh, while I'm not alone, it's not universal by any means. You can't get it replaced if you don't like it. I just went back to the 2015. I like that one. Line three, G.J. in uh, Snohomish, Washington. Hello, G.J. Leo, I haven't talked to you in so long. I'm G.J. A. Computer Pro, your old Twitter buddy from oh, many moons Wow. What you Happy been up 15, to? Happy 1500th. Thank um, you. You've been doing the show almost as long as the burning bush has been burning. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a joke for Dr. Mom. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I hope it keeps tired. burning. I would, I yes. retired as a computer pro. I moved up here to Snohomish, Washington, the land of net neutrality, thanks to Governor Jay Inslee. Yeah, you're the one state, Washington State, the one state with state net neutrality rules. California just weakened their rules in a significant way, so it's not going to happen here. But, uh, yes, bravo. You're doing. You're, you. you're, you're you. fighting the good fight up there. And I love it up here. Um, uh, and thank you. You know, I'm still stuck at that uh, like, like 7900 number on Twitter. You got me way up there as a, at sign a computer pro. Uh, and even though I'm very funny on Twitter, I'm still stuck at the same place. Oh, so. don't bemoan it. You know, because truthfully, Twitter. Come on, there's only a few know, people I there know. anyway. So Twitter, I, Twitter I, isn't a massive, uh, you know, uh, social success as Facebook is. That's true. I got. I know. Don't, don't, don't let's not get started on Facebook. I got two <laughs> new things. I got two new things this week that um, that I think are interesting, and I don't know if you've talked about yet. Um, I got the Fire TV Cube from Amazon. I have it, and I reviewed it yesterday on the new screensavers. But tell me what oh. you think. Um, I, well, mine's still in the box. I am a early adopter, but late implementer. <laughs> you oh. know, I understand because when you have to modify your home theater. No matter what it is, it's a massive challenge. You've got to pull things out, uh, unwire stuff, rewire stuff. Uh, but I have to say, the uh, uh, I'm sorry, Echo Cube, Echo Powered Fire TV Cube, is kind of cool because you can walk into the room and say TV on. Actually, all you have to say is let's watch Westworld or whatever. Let's watch, uh, you know, what uh, I've been watching Goliath on Amazon Prime. Let's watch Goliath. It'll turn on the TV, switch to the right place, and start the show, which is awesome. And then I when you leave, you say TV off, and it goes off, which is pretty nice. I noticed that it talks about an ARC port with HDMI. Um, it and likes, I my... if it can get CEC and ARC, the audio return channel, it would like that, but it's not required. Okay, and the other cool thing is I finally got YouTube Premium. I noticed that it changed from red to premium. Yeah, when yeah I... that happened yeah, this week. It. It's still YouTube yeah. red, same idea. You pay a fee, no ads. You also get access to Google's music offering for part of that. I think it's a good well, one deal. One of these days, I'm going to get my podcast going, and then I'll call you back again. I won't wait three years because I think it's been three years since we talked. But I wow. will get my podcast going, and I will talk to you again at a computer pro on the tweets. Yes, and on, on Facebook, and on Snapchat, and on Instagram, and on everything. That's me at a computer pro. GJ, great to talk to you. Thank you, sir. And I love your puppy in the picture. Is that? Is oh. That What's I've got two golden retrievers that are now but they'll be four years old and I'm a miniature long haired dachshund. Oh, and uh yeah, I love sweet. dogs. Very sweet. I love dogs. 
Well, it's nice to talk to you. Thank you, GJ. All right, take care. Our show today brought to you by uh, our great sponsor, LastPass. They are a life saver. LastPass saves my bacon all the time. It's the first program I install when I set up a new computer or phone. I install LastPass in my browser so that I automatically fill in passwords to websites. LastPass on my phone, it automatically fills in passwords to apps. See, I don't want to remember passwords. That's a bad thing. If you use passwords you can remember, you're not using good passwords. Maybe you're using the same password over and over. That's even worse. 81% of breaches are caused by weak or reused passwords. Passwords you can remember. Passwords you're using on more than one site. And it's really a problem in business. And I want to speak to anybody who owns a business here. We, I, had, I own this business. I had a problem because we had an engineer, couldn't remember his passwords, put them all in a spreadsheet on the public internet. So he could get to it whenever he needed to. Well, he had the right idea, the convenience of getting to it. He had the wrong idea in the sense that he was giving away our passwords to our most precious stuff, our servers, our bank accounts, our QuickBooks login. No! That's when we started using LastPass Enterprise. That's why you should use LastPass Enterprise. It creates long, strong, secure passwords, keeps them in a password vault, gives you complete control and access. You can even set password uh, requirements, length, strength, Require two-factor. We do that at work here. Uh, you can you can revoke permissions. You can give permissions. You can have folders that only certain people have access to. It simplifies password management for companies of any size with the tools you need to secure your business and centralize control of employee passwords and apps. It's why we use it, and I love it. And it's also because I believe in password managers. I believe in LastPass. Why we give every employee a LastPass account. There's a LastPass for every size business, whether it's LastPass Enterprise for a big business, LastPass Teams for teams of 50 or less, personal use, LastPass Premium, family use, LastPass Family. By the way, that's a great thing for a family to be able to share passwords. When my wife wants to log into Comcast, I say, oh, I already shared the password with you. It's in your LastPass. <gasps> Saves a lot of time. At work and at home, fix your password woes. Do it the right way. Steve Gibson vetted it and recommended it. I use it. I've been using it for years. LastPass. It is literally the number one most preferred password manager. And the one I tell you everybody ought to use. I wish you would use it now. Start today. Make this a LastPass day. Then you you could share the password to the Wi-Fi login with your mother and you wouldn't have this problem. She wouldn't have to call the tech guy. LastPass.com slash twit. LastPass.com slash twit. Choose the product that's right for you. I am a big believer in all of this. This really is important. LastPass has a security challenge, the uh, checkup that you can go through. Make sure that you haven't reused uh, passwords. They have an easy one-button password change procedure, so you can get go through a whole bunch of sites very quickly, update the password to something longer, stronger, more secure. I can go on and on. I'm a big fan. LastPass.com slash twit. Andrew in Nome, Alaska. Hello, Andrew. Hi, Leo. Great to talk to you. Yeah, I, all right. Thanks for taking my call. I have a question. I am building a power wall for my control room, and I'm having trouble because all these Samsung monitors, I uh, the remote control controls all of them. <laughs> we have that same problem. Because we have a lot of monitors in the studio. You change one, they all change. It's very frustrating. It is frustrating. I was wondering, is there some sort of hardware solution or something? Uh, well, what are you doing with the remote? I mean, don't you leave the monitor on what it, what it is, or why would you want to mess with it? Right, but when I turn the monitors on, uh, six of these are hospitality oh, monitors, and they default coax. I see. So if I could get an SDK and reprogram the firmware, that would work too. I see. Um, so that it would default to the input I want. Yeah, ideally what you'd like to do is somehow do this without the remote. Do it right. with software, right? Ah, that's an interesting have, question. I mean, you're using consumer grade uh, monitors, and uh, <clears throat> I guess they just, uh, it would be really nice if they had like a, a serial port in there for control. There used to be, it used to not be uh, uncommon to have a, I remember there was a video control port, uh, but I don't think monitor yeah. monitors uh, do that. How can, so let's ask the chat room because I don't know. Uh, is there a way? Not not to use the infrared remote, because the remote, mm -hmm. you're right, the remote works on all the, they're, they're not keyed to an individual. Right, I tried holding it right up to the sensor, and that doesn't work. I, I remember no, because these remotes are designed to spray it everywhere. 
Right, right. My DVR 15 years ago had this little thing I could glue on at the front of it and so that the DVR could control the TV. Yeah, an IR blaster. Mm -hmm. That might be the solution is an IR blaster. Uh, we were talking about the Echo Cube, the uh, Fire Cube, that actually has an IR blaster on it, but only has one. You'd need one right. for each. You'd need one for each. This is a, you know, I don't have an answer off the top of my head. Maybe the chat room will come up with one or somebody will call. Keep, keep listening. If you have multiple TVs and you want to control each individually, ideally in software, how would you do it? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. That's a great, really great question. I love that. Don't know the answer, though. Okay, let's see. Control your TV. What we don't want to do is infrared. Uh, there are remote apps for iOS and Android that use Wi-Fi because, of course... Uh, most phones don't have infrared. That might be a solution, right? Use Wi-Fi. Yeah. What I'm thinking, remember, didn't didn't there were didn't there used to be serial ports that you would control TVs with? The problem is they don't have them anymore. LG TV control using serial protocol bindings. Open Hab. Oh. Mm. So if you have a serial port on your TVs, um, sometimes they're marked service only. There may be a DB9 or some sort of proprietary. Yeah, you can do this with some TVs. This is interesting. So OpenHab, which is an open uh, home automation system, has some documentation for controlling TVs using a serial protocol. You'd need to first check those monitors and see if they had a service port or some sort of port and figure out if that does allow serial control. If it does, then you probably are golden because I would I would expect that each TV... The binding does not support querying the current state from the TV. Okay. So it's a one-way one -way channel. The protocol supports daisy-chaining of serial devices. The binding sends to the broadcast address. So you may have the same issue if you can't uniquely identify each TV and talk to each TV uniquely. Now, the remote Harmony remote uses uh, infrared. Uh, there is an R. It also may use RF, but you know you, that's that's specific to the TV. Simple control. Let's see what that is. Hmm. Here you go. That's interesting. Simplecontrol.com. It's an app. And it uses Wi-Fi, which might solve that. The, the question, though, would be, yeah, these are, these are all home automation solutions. The question is, would it be able to? That's interesting. This is a great challenge. Great question. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography. And we got smartphones, we got smart watches, augmented reality. 8888-ASK-LEO is my phone number. If you want to call and talk, ask a question, make a suggestion, 888-827-5536. That's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada outside that area. You could still use Skype. Chris Marquardt, our photo guy, is coming up in about half an hour. Uh, talk about uh, getting better images. I think we might be ready for a photo review of our 
assignment, which was to take a picture illustrating the word or concept of hand. I think it might be this week. All coming up. I, the chat room, our chat room at irc.twit.tv, loves a challenge. <laughs> and they've been just going on and on about this last caller. He's a network engineer. He's got a server room. He says he's building a power wall, a bunch of Samsung monitors to monitor different things. And um, he's got a problem because, it, you know, he uh, wants different TVs to point to different sources and so forth. But if he uses the remote control, they're all the same Samsung TV. Any remote control will change them all. And that's no good. And there are, and some TVs have serial ports. Uh, sometimes they're marked as service ports. Sometimes they're not standard serial ports, DB9s or something like that, or DB25s. There's some sort of weird oddball port, so you might need an adapter. But that would be the ideal way, is to connect serial cables to software, and then you'd have a screen somewhere that you could say, this TV should be doing this. That would be the ideal way. And I think in some TVs it would be doable. You just have to figure out if you have a serial interface to that TV. And if you can address that TV specifically instead of broadcasting a command to them all. So that's the correct way to do it. There's also, and I, and I don't know who to credit with uh, in the chat room for this one. A number of people have uh, suggested it. But <laughs> this is, I mean, I think Turtle was the first. Get a, a small, a toilet paper roll or similar tube, tape it over the infrared <laughs> receiver on each TV so you're making it kind of highly directional so it can't see the backscatter and then you can use the infrared remote with each just by you know putting it to the edge of the tube and of course then you've got a weird looking wall with a bunch of toilet paper tubes taped to it but <laughs> but it would work <laughs> oh man <laughs> 8888 Ask Leo. The chat room is great. There is nothing they can't come up with a solution for either weird or serious or both. In this case, both. Adam in Ontario, California. Hello, Adam. Hey, Leo. How you doing? I am well. How are you? Very good. Thank you. You know, I thought I remembered seeing actually an app on the Google Play Store for Android. Yeah, it's one of those remote control apps that allows you to control multiple screens. Yeah, if you have, so, if you if you can do it with Wi-Fi, on Wi-Fi, yeah, correct. then you probably would. It probably would be effective because presumably each TV would have its own, you know, identifier. So yeah, look there. Right. I've seen a number right. of remote control apps that claim to do something like that. So you're right. That's another option. Because they were doing it with gaming, like gamers who had multiple monitors and whatnot. I think it's more what it was geared towards, but it seems like it would work. Yeah, I think but. you're absolutely right. Yeah, and, and so IR infrared's a problem because it's you know it blasts light everywhere. In fact, we were talking about that Amazon right. Cube. I can control almost anything with the Cube because each face of the Cube has an infrared blaster on it, and so it just scatters exactly. light throughout the whole room. You don't see it because it's outside the visible spectrum, but the TVs see it, and so it doesn't have to be line of sight. So it's it's that's the design, but you don't want it to be that way. Then you have to do something else, and I think Wi-Fi probably would work better. So good point. Yes. Yeah, it'd be worth a shot at least. Yeah, absolutely. But um, my original question was, with the um, remote PC, I remember you saying how you could even access, you know, a computer at home with a mobile device. Does that work in reverse? Can you oh. access a mobile device from a computer? Wouldn't that be nice? And, <laughs> no. and how would that work in terms of like a, a stolen phone or if right. not that, even like a stolen laptop? So remote PC sponsor, we should give that disclaimer. Uh, it does not work in the opposite direction, and mo I've never seen a remote PC uh, program style program, remote access program that would go from a computer to a phone, let you control a phone remotely, unless that phone is physically connected. And uh, and then what about even just a laptop? Oh well, yeah, you can control a laptop from another f laptop, but you can't control like, a phone so from a laptop. Right. Well, if you had a desktop and suppose you had a laptop stolen, you could like oh yeah, yeah, totally uh, turn on absolutely. turn on the location services absolutely and see where your your you, laptop was. Yeah. You totally absolutely right. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be good for that. There are a number of uh, solutions 
kind of like that. There's one called LoJack. I mean, you know, LoJack for cars. They have one for laptops. Does roughly the same thing. Yeah. It's a little bit of software that's run. The, of course, the issue is how sophisticated the thief is. If they're really sophisticated, in fact, I think most thieves these days immediately turn the computer off, and then right. then you can't do anything. But that's if, true. That's if the, true. If the guy just off, steals it, it and this on. happens all the time. You sit in a coffee shop, somebody walks by, uh, takes your just gets your laptop and runs. If the guy just steals it to use it, as soon as he turns it on, yeah, you bet you'd know exactly where it is. Right, right, right. Or even if they're selling it to a pawn shop, I'd imagine they'd want right. to turn it on to verify that it works at some point. Yeah, pawn That's shops. A small window, I guess. It'd be my guess that most pawn shops do not want to accept stolen goods. So they're not going to, you know, turn it off and leave it off. Because they know right, that right. that's how that's what you do if you if you've stolen it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good, yeah, good suggestion, Adam. Absolutely, that's a very All that right. would be a great use for it. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate it too. Have a good one, Brian and in Indio, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. How are you doing? Today? I'm well, Brian. How are you? Oh, pretty good. I got a couple questions for you. Sure. First one involving what are your recommendations for doorbell cameras? Yeah. Oh, well, oh, you're asking. <laughs> yeah, which, which or model? Well, I'll tell you which one I use, and I should say they are a sponsor, is Ring, the Ring Video Doorbell. Nest now has a doorbell as well. And uh, that I don't haven't tried it yet, but it might be a, an interesting uh, one to look at because uh, the Nest uh, has face recognition built into it. Ring does not. So the Nest will, when you uh, when somebody comes to the door, I, and I don't know this, but this is what Stacey Higginbotham is one of our uh, co-hosts and uh, does an IOT show and newsletter. She says it's kind of interesting because it will announce the person. It'll say, Irma's at the door. She said that can be a little annoying, <laughs> but if, you know, of course, you could turn it off. But that's interesting. So that's the, the uh, Nest doorbell cam. I have also tried the Skybell, and uh, I did not like the Skybell. I had problems with the Skybell. In fact, the reason I tried it is because somebody called the show and said, I can't get this thing to work. So I ordered one. Had similar problems. Skybell has since been updated, so they may have fixed those problems. But I can tell you the one I've used and really like is Ring. And Ring has some of features that uh, the Nest does not have, like the neighborhood watch stuff, which I think is really cool. You can share with your neighbors video from your Ring doorbell, which will uh, be very helpful, I think, in uh, in catching somebody who's, you know, going down the street stealing packages or something like that. The Nest Hello video doorbell is a little more expensive, uh, but I like the uh, I like the face recognition. I think that's kind of interesting. So I probably should order one and try it. In both in both cases, and this is something people forget with these devices, you're going to be paying a monthly fee for a subscription to the video. So it's you can look at the price but then you should also look at what they're going to charge you to store the video because all of these devices with cameras, almost all of them upload to the servers so that you can then look at them. And actually, that can be very cool because I can look at this my doorbell from anywhere. I don't have to be on my home network to look at my doorbell. I can even use my, uh, my Echo Show or the new uh, Fire TV Cube. I can say to the Cube, Echo, show my front door, and it'll show that, which is, which is cool. Uh, but but there is a monthly fee for that kind of uh, capability. Hey, Chris. Hey, Leo. How are oh, you? Oh, you sound good. You look good. You are yeah. good. You're ah, good. Bad. So I got this. Uh, I don't know. I might regret this. But I got this uh, camera phone. The new oh. the P20. This has a Leica lens. And it's 20 megapixels. And then uh, does it, it has a 20 megapixel a monochrome lens got th I think three lenses on it. The P20 is uh, yeah, Huawei, the P20. right? Yeah, it's Huawei. It's not a great phone because it's their version of Android which is terrible, but um I'm I haven't taken many pictures with it yet, but I'm very intrigued and the camera app, wow, does it have a lot of features. It's kind of Looking impressive. Good. Night mode, you could aperture mode, Portrait mode. Is, is the P, is the P20 their their top of the line phone the right P20 now? P20 Pro is their top of the line, yeah, and it's like you know they All have right. the Leica branding right on it. I don't know because because I have just recently seen seen a comparison of some of the top of the line phones of different manufacturers and their photo capabilities and. They're pretty much pretty much all the same. I think they're all the same. DxO yeah. Mark gave this marginally higher than anybody else, but yeah, <clears throat> who cares about DxO? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's only a tech mark, but it doesn't really yeah. tell you anything about it's the creative possibilities. Yeah. 
uh, in a way, this is almost there's almost too many creative possibilities. I mean, there's just so many. <laughs> that, uh, fe features can also be a distraction. Yeah. Yeah. There's a pro mode. But it looks cool. Yeah. I'm gonna take some pictures. Figure out how how good it is. I I I, I don't trust it completely because it is Chinese and. They ask for all sorts of information that the American oh you mean you mean it's going to send you for your pictures somewhere? I'm not worried about the pictures, but it but, <laughs> but right at the beginning before you do anything else, it says for purposes of weather, we need to know uh, we need your permission to get your locale, your IMEI number, and your really? MAC address. What the heck do they need your? They don't need for? that <laughs> for weather. But then, but but that's the one of the first permissions you give them. It's literally the second permission you give them. Oh, and at wow. that point, you've given Huawei. Complete access. It's pretty much. It's it's almost almost as bad as a social security number. Yeah, <laughs> they they can pinpoint what you're personally doing. Now I don't know why the Chinese it's government so would dodgy. care, <laughs> but still, I don't. Yeah, it's pretty dodgy. And you know, I was I was like, should I put LastPass on here? Should I put, you know, any of my you know private? Well, I wouldn't. Stuff? After that, I wouldn't. <laughs> no. The in one interesting okay. thing is you can root it. They have an okay, okay. They have an unlocking uh, code you can get on their website, and I'm thinking maybe oh, if so, I so, root this and put so, it. So you mean so, so you mean you can put another firmware on that's from an even less secure third party? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good point. That sounds fun. Good point. <laughs> Oh, from wow. someone who who you don't don't know at all. At all. And yeah, Huawei at off. least is you know Huawei's a. Uh, I mean, they have an office somewhere at least. Yeah. They're a good, I thought they were a good company. They made one of the Pixel, the, the Pixel, the 6P, I think, was made by Huawei. And don't, don't get me wrong, I'm a great fan of open source, but that I know. just sounds... that was when I saw that, I went, "What?" That yeah. it was, and there were, at least they were upfront about it. All right, I got to run. I'll talk to you in 15. Talk to you. Thank you. 888-827-5536. Uh, don't forget the website techguylabs.com. You can go to the website free, no sign up and find anything I've talked about on today's show or any of the 1,500 shows. Uh, 15, you know, I have to, a, a tip of the hat to a KFI and its great program director who's still there, Robin Bertolucci, who uh, brought me in uh, January 4th, 2004, uh, brought me in. They had their, their, their previous computer show guy had gone across town, gone to another station, she called me up. I'd worked for her in San Francisco years before. She said, would you like to do a radio show on KFI in Los Angeles? We'll call you the tech guy on KFI. See how it rhymes. And uh, and I said, well, heck yeah. Work for you, Robin, anytime. And a testament to her, because program director of major market radio stations, not what you would call a long-term job in most cases, they're the first person to get fired if anything goes wrong. But she has been an amazing steward of one of the great radio stations in the country. And the fact that she and I are both still here <laughs> after 14 years is a great testament to her brilliance <laughs> and, and competence and my good fortune having uh, taken a job with her. So thank you, Robin, for 1,500 shows. And please don't fire me. I'd like to do 1,500 more if you don't mind. Uh, actually, Robin, after three years uh, working just at uh, KFI, Robin very kindly uh, suggested that we syndicate the show and uh, went to her boss at Clear Channel and said, this guy's good. You should put him on. And now we're on almost 200 stations all over the country. Uh, and I've been doing that for 11 years. So thank you to uh, to Premier Radio Networks, to, to Clear Channel, to KFI, and, and to Robin for uh, for putting the tech guy on the air 1,500 shows later. Line three, Jim, Tallahassee, Florida. Hello, Jim. Afternoon. Afternoon. Uh, I won't embarrass either one of us by telling you how long I've been listening to y'all. Well, you know, I was a child prodigy. <laughs> well, I, think I, I haven't paid attention to your age, but I think we're about the same generation. I think we are. Generation. Yeah, well, I was telling uh, Kim earlier in the show that I started in radio, good Lord, 42 years ago. So that'll give you some idea. Well, I was fixing radio. I was fixing TV transmitters and things back 42 years oh, ago. Oh, there you go. Were you a, a radio engineer? 
a licensed first phone with marine radar endorsement. Nice, a first ticket. And those were the creme de la creme in those days. Yeah, well, they done changed <laughs> them to general, so. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's depressing. I know. You used, to have a you used to have to have a license to do what I'm doing. <laughs> I, yeah, that I, was a third class. I got my radio third class, yep, with broadcast endorsement. I have it somewhere. Uh, nobody, FCC hasn't asked for that in some time. Yep. Well, I got a couple questions about Android. Yes. Now, I'm legally blind, so uh, I don't have access to plugging my phone into someone's cigarette lighter when it needs charging, and the city bus is what my transportation is limited to. <laughs> I don't think they have, they have cigarette lighters. <laughs> no, I don't think they have them in the buses, no. <laughs> yeah, so uh, do you know of a company that has or is contemplating going back to replaceable batteries no no one's doing that's, that but the good news is and of. the reason i think they're not doing it is you can get portable battery packs that are great and the idea is you carry that in your coat pocket and you can have them as big as you want uh, you know, the little lightweight ones are not much bigger uh, they're heavier than your phone, and they'll charge your phone one whole time. But you can get ones that'll do three or four times or longer. Uh, so I carry one of those with me at all times. Uh, my favorite manufacturer of these is Anchor, A-N-K-E-R. They sell them on Amazon. So if you just go to Amazon and you look for Anchor battery, battery packs or portable, actually, I guess, Portable chargers are probably the right way to search for this. The PowerCore 5000 is $18. It's about the size of a cigarette lighter itself. Uh, and it's, So it's very compact. And it just has a USB port on it. You just plug in your cable to your phone, and it'll recharge your phone all the way to the, the tippity top. Well, just have to be careful when you plug the thing in. Yeah, then, I wouldn't worry about those. They're small enough. They're not going to be a, a problem. It's kind of like carrying an extra phone battery. Well, the next question is for your brain trust. Yes. Uh, I have, being we're down in Florida, of course, the weather never changes in Florida. It's always hot. <laughs> uh, but It's just a question of less hot or more hot, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, my, my question slash complaint or hoping that your guys can come up with a better app is I've got about a half a dozen weather apps on my phone and I kind of just take what they're saying and then average them together. And that's, that's probably a good system, yeah. Well, it, it, it kind of works, but, uh, you know, I don't understand how the same app can have two different current temperatures. Yeah, you know, that is weird, isn't it? Well, like I said, that and the fact, you know, I, I've, I like I said, the... I had one time when I had uh, one app tell me it was 20% chance of rain, and the other app told me it was 80% chance of rain. And that's an awful lot of averaging to do. I had high hopes. There was an app that I really liked that got the weather from, you know, there's several weather services. Ultimately, uh, the best probably is the U.S. Weather Service or NOAA. Um, well, I've I've got I've got you know I've got the NOAA app, I've got the National Weather Service app. Yeah. But even even using the same app, they get different uh, results. Yeah. Well, they give they give different temperatures. Well, that's have, that's probably mostly because of a lag in updating, right? Because they only they don't to save your battery, they're not going to update all the time. So that's just a lag in update, and they have different reporting stations in different locations. But more to me, more important is that sometimes the forecasts vary <laughs> significantly. Uh, a lot of uh, people use YR.no, which is the Norwegian Weather Service. That one's free. Um, let me, I'll tell you if I could find this app for you, because there was one I really liked because it allowed you to use your own home weather station in addition. Let me look for it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So the idea, which was a great idea, was you'd, you'd have a weather station that would be your local weather. That would be reported not only to you, but it would also be reported to the rest of the users. So you'd have better weather results. Yeah, it looks like they've gotten out of that business. Now they're doing something. Oh, uh, okay. 
Okay, here's the world's largest. So this this is I wonder if this Yeah, so this was this this I guess is still around. But can you get the net atmo or they kind of they stopped doing it. So they sold a weather station. It was kind of a nice looking weather station that you would put in. Yeah, there it is. Then you'd get the app and you'd always know what the weather was like at your house cuz you'd have the weather station. But then they also aggregated everybody else who had a net atmo. Uh, and yeah, I wonder if they still sell this. They have a rain gauge, a wind gauge, 150 bucks. But then when you use the app, actually, you don't have to buy the uh, weather station to use the app. But if you wanted, uh, you know, hyper local weather, you could do that. See, and then, and then you'd know what your weather was in your neighborhood. Good ratings. I, I like this. Should I do this? Let's get, let's get this. Weather station plus rain gauge. I want the wind gauge, too. I want it all, my friend. I want it all. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Time for Chris Marquardt, the photo guy. Chris, uh, I was at, Chris lives in Germany. Which you may not know, because he, you know, he sounds like he's sitting next to me, but he's actually in Germany. I can, I can put my German accent on you, <laughs> on for you, Leo. You have no accent at all. That's the other thing. He speaks perfect English, uh, not as, true. <laughs> as do many Germans, oddly enough. Uh, but I was asking him because we have in America, we have a fetish about weather. We really love weather, and weather apps and weather stations. I found that weather station. We'll talk more about that after Chris's segment. I want to use up his segment. But I was wondering, do Germans have the same fetish? Of course they do. Yeah. Everyone has. It. Yeah. It's, it's, especially as the weather here is not really that predictable. Europe <laughs> tends to tends to be like good for one or two days and then the forecast just the less yeah, I don't predictable. I don't trust forecasts. I like I like my little one hour preview for like when I when I'm out with a group of photographers like on this weekend we had a workshop so I want to know what's ha what's going to well, happen yeah. in the next hour and if you're that's, a photographer that's most important you, for you me. You need yeah. that. Yeah. And we've talked okay. about the, the photographer's ephemeris TPE which is a uh, an, an app for uh, your smartphone that will tell you things like where the sun is, the moon is, where the stars are. You need to add that to the weather, though, because if it's cloudy, it doesn't matter where anything is. So yeah, we are I'm, ready for an assignment review. I don't want to waste we too much time on weather because we've got a lot of pictures of hands to talk about. Well, weather, weather and photography are closely related. They are. Though. They are. That's yeah. a that's a topic we could we could talk about for another <laughs> another entire hour if we want to. Um, we had the hand assignment. And hands are such a rewarding subject when you when you do photography because hands always tell stories. People use their hands all the time. Hands show age. Hands show um, the, the, there's there's jewelry. There's other decoration on hands, and it's, it's it is just wonderful what people do with hands. And I love including hands in photos uh, when I take pictures of people. Um, it's yeah, it's just. A part of your body that tells a lot of stories. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, people have delivered wonderful photos and I've again taken the time to look through them. And I've chosen three pictures that have something in common other than uh, showing hands. Um, the first one is by Rod Golda. It's titled Henna. And what we see is uh, a woman putting uh, it's, it's a henna tattoo on a person's hand. I think it's called a, a Mandy or something like that. Um, I don't know that, but I, we know henna tattoos, yeah. What, 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 what she does is she, she puts a henna paste on a, on, a, on a person's hand and then that uh, sits there for a while and it kind of adds the color to the hand and then you wash it off and you have this uh, tattoo on your hand that's temporary and that, that'll uh, go away after a few days. And... Um, it's well. It's decoration on the hand. It's it's like a tattoo. Uh, I like this photo because it's a very colorful thing. The person applying the tattoo, uh, the, the, her clothes are very colorful. It uh, it suggests she's she's uh, probably from from uh, from an Indian heritage or something. Um, the the only kind of a bit of distracting thing is the is the is the green hose in the background and the Walmart bag but that's uh that's in the bokeh so it doesn't really bother always me too always a much. problem for me is the messy backgrounds are backgrounds. always difficult yeah. Yes. yeah if you could just cut that out this would be so strong 
True. Yeah. So, so here is a hand being decorated with a temporary tattoo. The second picture I've chosen is by Alan Guido, Shadow of the Day. And I like that because it's it, what we're looking at is some, this is maybe a door or top of a box or something, a wooden uh, thing and a shadow of a hand on it which is framed within shadows. So you have a little corner in the photo um, showing this frame, the shadow of a hand, and then you see the hand that is responsible for that shadow in the left top of the photo. And uh, while, while it's not a tattooed hand, it's interesting because that box has some graffiti on it, some writing on it, and the it's really interesting to see how that writing kind of combines with the shadow of the hand. So it's kind of a temporary tattoo on that shadow of the hand, which I really like. I do like uh, it. And I love wood grain for some reason in photography. And the wood grain is weathered wood. So yeah. it, it, the wood itself tells quite a story. There's a, on the top, there's a stain, coffee stains on it from a cup or something. So it might be in a workshop. I don't really know this color flaking off of it. It's cool. Uh, very yeah. Very cool. Good stories, lots of stories in that photo. And the last but not least, uh, by David um, Potsier, Count on Your Fingers. So uh, that, that this is, one is great. That is a, this is hysterical. Isn't it? It's a montage. So we're, we're looking at an outstretched hand. Uh, again, tattoos. So that's what kind of keeps those, the, what, what, what combines those three pictures or what makes them similar. Um, and the outstretched hand, what David did is he photoshopped uh, a hand on each of the fingers. So it's the same hand. And on the pinky, it shows a one. And on the uh, on the ring finger, it shows two. And on the middle finger, it shows the number three and the four and the five. So it's a hand with hands for fingers. And uh, that is such a creative idea. It's just, it's interesting. It's well executed technically well executed uh, because he definitely took those pictures of the other hands in the same light. You see the shadows going in the same direction. Oh, it yeah. fits seamlessly. Um, good job. And again, as I said, the tattoo theme uh, repeating in that one as well. So, Are you seeing more uh, abstract, photoshopped style pictures like this these days? Because it's so easy to do now thanks to software. Um. Uh, I mean, there are certainly a lot of those, but um, either some of them are really well done and you don't notice that right. they have right. been. You may, you may be seeing them and not knowing. That's right. Yeah. Or it's like it's one of these uh, kind of shots where it's obvious that that is a manipulation because you wouldn't see something like that in, in the real world. Um, but in general, no, not really. I've uh, And it, it kind of depends. I don't really look around searching for these kind of photos but um i really like at the moment someone is that creative it really kind of blows my mind because uh, you have to have that idea first right it, the, the execution only comes after you have the idea so the idea is what counts here and then if, if that's a well executed idea that gets uh, bonus points from me and this was definitely uh Intriguing, without attempting yes. to deceive. I mean, it's obviously yes. photoshopped. Oh, obviously not. Well, we've thank you all of you from your for your submissions. Uh, there were some very nice ones. You can see all of them if you go to the, the Flickr group, uh, the Tech Guy group on Flickr, f l i c k r dot com. Flickr is a free photo sharing site owned by Smug Mug, good friends and a really great company. So they bought them from from uh, Yahoo a couple of weeks ago. Really a relief to us because we now know it'll be in good hands. And we have a group there, Tech Guy Group, which has tens of thousands of members and lots of photos. In fact, let's do another assignment. What do you say, Chris? Uh, I definitely have one here. And we are, we're going to stick with the general theme of body parts. This time we're going to look at eyes. So the next assignment eyes. is about eyes. Hmm. 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 Eyes. Okay. The eyes are the windows to the soul. So this should be... A good subject. Although Absolutely. it doesn't have to um, be, I mean, it's E-Y-E-S, but it doesn't have to be eyeballs. Well, there's lots of eyes around us. <laughs> okay. okay. I'm, I'm going to do this one. I keep forgetting, and I'm going to do this one. So here's how it Practice works. Practice with your 50-millimeter lens. I will. I'm going to do it with my Nifty 50 manual focus, because I need to practice that. 
Uh, here's how it works. Uh, you take a picture, and if you find one you like that illustrates the idea eyes, tag it with eyes, upload it to Flickr. It's free to do that. And then, and then submit it to the Tech Guy group. Our moderator, Renee Silverman, she's great. She'll send you a note saying thank you. You can do up to one a week. And in about four weeks, so you have four chances here, Chris will pick three that he wants to talk about on the show. You'll find Chris's work. He's a great photographer and great workshops, too, at discoverthetopfloor.com. And we'll talk again next week, Chris. Thank you. Talk to you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, I found a uh, a weather station that you can uh, that uploads to uh, Weather Underground. So that probably is a better way to do it, since Weather Underground is kind of like a public. Yeah, I was I was thinking about getting a Net Atmo because yeah, I'm also a bit of a it's numbers fun. nerd. But but uh, I, I wouldn't have a good place to put it other than close to the house. And then this one, this one doesn't, doesn't give me the right this, readings. This, I'm looking at it's called the um, Ambient Weather. It's uh, cheaper than the NetAtmo because it includes uh, all these sensors. So it's on Amazon for $169 US. Mm -hmm. And it's Wi-Fi and battery-powered. So you could... Wi-Fi and battery-powered. Yeah, oh. so you could put it fairly distant from the... Uh, well, these are backup batteries. It does say it well, wants I think a DC we can get adapter. that here, yeah. It uses... Oh, you know what? Because if you're going to use a Wi-Fi, you probably need DC. Yeah, the Wi-Fi would... Would uh, yeah. take up too much power. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And then, oh it, well, maybe I just I just rely on the Norwegians. Maybe I just yeah, rely on I like Norwegians. That's my weather app. That's what I use. That's my too. weather app too. Yes, and they they're perfectly good for the U.S. as well as uh, Europe. I mean, they do fine. Yeah, they yeah. absolutely. Yeah. They have good data. Bob the mechanic says weather stations need daily maintenance. Oh man, <laughs> oh man. This monitors indoor and outdoor conditions, wind speed, wind direction, rainfall, UV, solar radiation, indoor temperature, indoor humidity, barometric pressure, dew point, heat index, wind chill, and more. Wow. Wow. Well, well, well. Daily maintenance. Hmm. I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to dust it I, I, off. I want to set it and forget it kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. That's why the NetAtmo looks good. It's kind of in a sealed tube, and it looks like it probably doesn't need daily maintenance, but mm. who knows. Thank you, oh, Chris. Wow. All right. Great to talk to you. Next See you week next then. week. Thank you, my friend. Take care. Bye bye. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. I guess uh, when I mentioned that Flickr had been acquired, it was a surprise to some of you. So let me let me reiterate because I think this is really good news. Flickr, which is a long time photo sharing site, it's been around since the early two thousands, uh, was owned by Yahoo and frankly neglected by Yahoo towards the end. It hadn't really been updated much. In fact. Some of the signs of neglect are still there. They, for instance, uh, I can't do a slideshow anymore because it requires Flash. <laughs> uh, they'll fix that. Uh, was purchased by uh, another site that I've been using since 2005 called Smug Mug. There, this is a site that lets professional photographers create a website for portfolio review, for sharing with family, friends, and clients. Uh, it does a beautiful job displaying your photos. It has lots of uh, templates so you can make it look as you wish. It also offers e-commerce uh, opportunities. So they, you can get photo printing through there, mugs, calendars, placemats, mouse pads, and uh, all of that you can mark up if you want to make a little money on the side. So it's a, a very, it's a not free, and but it's very much beloved by professional photographers, and I've used it forever. Leo.camera is where I put my uh, best shots. That's a smug mug site. So they acquired Flickr, and they're slowly moving everything over. They've moved the engineering team over. They're going to keep the Flickr engineering team, Yahoo. <laughs> well, maybe I shouldn't say Yahoo. Woohoo. Yay. <laughs> and uh, But there are. It's, you still have to log in through Yahoo's authentication servers. It's taken them a while, but they say they'll be able to get all the data and the software moved over fairly quickly uh, because they're similar. And in fact, they've been working together for a long time. They're all friends. So it's really, really good news. It means Flickr will survive. It doesn't, they, they don't overlap because, as I said, SmugMug's really for displaying your photos. Flickr's for sharing your photos, for putting them up, letting other people comment on them, interact with them. There's groups and things. That's why we use it for the, for the Chris Markmart segment, our, our photo guy's um, assignment, monthly assignment, because it's a great place to share photos. So Flickr will stick around as Flickr.com, SmugMug will stick around as SmugMug.com, but 
together, I think they're going to be a big improvement. I'm very, very excited about this. And, it, and for those of us who loved Flickr but were worried, a huge relief. Let's talk about weather stations. Uh, and I'd love to hear from you. So we, a caller right before Chris was asking you know, about weather and why different apps give you different results. I asked a meteorologist about this once. And he said, well, <laughs> you know, it, they, get, they all get their data from the same place, the U.S. Weather Service. But how they interpret it, how they display it, how often they update it really varies. And so, for instance, he said, don't use Yahoo Weather. That's terrible. <laughs> but if you, you know, weather.gov is the kind of the canonical source of information. But what's interesting is there are other weather apps that will use this data in conjunction with personal weather station data. And the one I was trying to remember is NetAtmo, N-E-T-A-T-M-O. You can buy a NetAtmo weather station for under $200 and then use the NetAtmo software to see what your local, hyper-local weather is at your house or your business and then see forecasts based on that information plus weather service information. Uh, it works with Amazon's Echo and, and things like that. So you could say, hey, what temperature is it outside and it will query your personal weather station. I see others, though, uh, at Amazon that are less expensive or have more capability for the same price. So, uh, And a number of those tie into a well-known kind of, I don't know how to describe it. Is it a open source weather system, the Weather Underground? And I think the Weather Underground is an interesting idea. It's kind of uh, a bunch of other people's weather stations many weather stations if you buy them can automatically upload your data to the weather underground these are weather junkies like many many people are uh, and i think it's i think it's a very interesting uh, business i i think they're associated with the weather channel i'm not sure i think the weather channel acquired the weather underground i think that's what happened whether that will make it better or worse i don't know i think it'll make it better right i think the weather channel is pretty much all about weather so that's another thing to look at. There's Weather Underground apps. They're free. There's also Weather Channel apps. They're free. And, uh, and you can get a weather, if you want a local weather, you can get a weather station that you put outside your house. Now, somebody in the chat room said, just remember, weather stations <laughs> require uh, updates <laughs> and, and, and fixes. And more importantly, maintenance. you got to clean them. Okay. Uh, it takes some of the fun out of it, doesn't it? Uh, Bob, the mechanic, who's the guy who told me this, said a lot of weather data also comes f not from the National Weather Service, but from Met services of other countries, uh, all registered by the World Meteorological Organization. And we'd mentioned uh, YR.no, the Norwegian Weather Service. That's one. So, yeah, I mean, weather is a global phenomenon. The interesting thing is weather forecasting has actually become more accurate. Why do you think? Because of powerful computing. And it's and artificial intelligence, or maybe it'd be better to say machine learning, but it's improving our weather forecasting. We were much better, for instance, in predicting major storms uh, in the last few years than we have been in decades previous. The five-day forecast has become as accurate as a three-day forecast. It's hard to do weather because it's what we call a chaotic system. In theory, you could model weather perfectly just as a computer can you know model a, a, a manufacturing process or a chess game the thing is with a manufacturing process the computer has access to all the inputs all the information and within if, if you can get total information awareness uh, on a process you can predict it and control it very accurately whether <laughs> It's a chaotic system. It's unpredictable. We don't know. We can't, we can't necessarily attribute cause and effect to different weather conditions. There's too many variables, too many things. It makes it very hard. You need a massive computer to do this. And it is probably the case that in the next 10 years or so, with the advent of computing, it's called quantum computing, which will give us significantly more computing capabilities, that we will be finally able to model weather fairly accurately over a long period of time, like months and years. Right now, <laughs> you know, weather forecast is pretty unpredictable. It depends where you live, but it can be pretty unpredictable. It's a fascinating subject, isn't it? 
Uh, and I and I do think that the advent of machine learning and computing power over the next few years, you're going to see weather become more accurate, much more accurate. 8888 Ask Leo. That's uh, my phone number. If you want to talk about weather or anything else, this is all about technology, right? And how technology is amazingly changing the world that we live in. Uh, Sacramento, David on the line. Hi, David. Thanks for hanging on. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Thanks, Hi. Leo. Long time listener. Hi. Uh, D, uh, 73DE Whiskey 6JH. <laughs> Very nice to talk to you. Whiskey 6 Tango Whiskey Julia, Tango. Julia Alpha Hotel. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but thank you. <laughs> no, I'm, that's a, my call I'm, a, sign. A, I'm a terrible <laughs> ham because I realized after I got all this set up and got the license and everything, I got a general license, I realized I talk on the radio all the time. I have no desire to go home and talk some more. I'm not like Me Art too. Bell. Uh, he would go back on the air and just keep talking. Me too. I do D-Star most of the time now because... That's cool, isn't that it? Yeah, yeah, D it is. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Anyway, my question is stupid, and uh, it's a very simple thing. I've, I've got a couple of Western Digital uh, solid-state hard drives, uh, pocket drives that I've had hooked up to my dish network to, as a alternative way to absolve movies to and they want you to reformat it and and once it's reformatted that way a regular computer can't reformat it I can't that's right see it. that's right I because because so they have a this is a copy protection scheme uh, they have a proprietary format which is required for use with the dish but won't work with anything else, so you can't copy programs. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Correct. Isn't that isn't that stinky? A few of my old radios are like that. Yeah, it's not. TiVo did it. A number of companies do this, and probably it isn't that complicated a proprietary format. Probably it's just a slight modification. And yeah. If, and if you looked around, I bet you'd find people. But yeah, so that means you have to dedicate. You have to, yeah, but you have to dedicate those those USB sticks to that device, basically. Yeah. All right, Leo. Thanks so much. Listening for years. I love thanks, you. Thanks. Hey, uh, Keith512 in our chat room says uh, Linux will see it. It's probably a, an opera. So Linux can, unlike Windows and Mac, which are limited to the number of file right, systems. Right, exactly. I used to be Linux nerd. All right. Well, he says that you, you know might that. be able to read it in Linux. That'd be worth a try. Okay. I will try that. All thanks, right. Leo. My pleasure. Love you. Take care. Love you, too. Thanks for Seven listening. 7-3. Seven, three. Love my hams. Yes, I do. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here. The tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. We've got smartphones. we got smart watches. we got all sorts of gizmos and gadgets. This is the tech show. So if you've got a question or a comment or a suggestion about technology, I'd love to hear from you. My phone number is 8888-ASK-LEO. Toll free in the U.S. and Canada, 8888-ASK-LEO. There's a uh, website. It's free also. No sign-up or anything. It's techguylabs.com. And whenever we talk about something, links will show up there. I want to put a link to uh, a, a weather station that Bob the Mechanic in our chat room recommends. He said, if you really want a good weather station, go to Gill Instruments and get a MetPak RG. It'll only be $3,000. Oh, man. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I don't even know the weather that bad. I could just look out the window. We are fascinated by weather, aren't we? Here in Northern California, it's very consistent. We have a rainy season, a dry season. Temperatures are pretty predictable within a range during those two seasons. That's about it. There's no lightning. There's no hurricanes. There's no tornadoes. <laughs> Rain is only, you know, five months a year. That's that. So it's... Eh, I think probably don't need a $3,000 weather station to know which way the wind blows. Rachel in Springfield, Illinois. Hello, Rachel. Lee Laporte, the tech guy. Hey there, Leo. How's it going? Great. How are you, Rachel? Long, I'm good. Long time no talk. About a few months, probably. <laughs> well, it's about time, then. I've been missing you. Congratulations on 1500 Holy cow. That's awesome. Holy cow. Amazing. So, Thank when you. When did you start this show? When did you start this one? Uh, the Tech Guy show started June, uh, January 4th, 2004. And you can go back and listen to that first episode if you want. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's all recorded. <laughs> so all right. you, you finished your TV days and went yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so what <laughs> happened was I quit. I've been radio since my ute. Uh, but when uh, Tech TV came along and I was doing two shows a day, five days a week, I, I, I didn't, I didn't 
want to, but I felt like, well, I really need to see my family. So <laughs> I didn't want to, but I thought I should. So I uh, quit the radio, and that was in 2000, uh, no, I guess 1998. And then in 2004, when the cable channel started to founder, and I saw the writing on the wall, that was, thankfully, when Robin called me from KFI, and I said, yes. And I did work seven days a week for some time, but... Well, I'm that's glad a typical radio person anyway. Isn't it? Have you ever worked in radio, Rachel? <laughs> yes, actually I do. You yeah. have that voice. You sound great. Oh, thank you. What's, what, <laughs> thank you. what station are you on? Um, I do some community radio now. I used to be um, on a local station here in Springfield, Illinois, WNNS, but I do some community radio now with WQNA. You know, it's not just the voice. It's you, you have a confidence that oh, comes across you. yeah you, you sound you. and that's important right you don't want to go on the uh on the radio and sound like i you have to pretend <laughs> even if you don't even if you're not confident you pretend right, you're confident, right? exactly exactly <laughs> so what yeah. can i do yeah. for you i wanted to follow up with you um a couple things actually while i have you too i wanted to see if possibly i could catch up with somebody off the air i'm totally blind um i'm also uh I had come up to see you uh, when I was getting my guide dog in San Rafael. Kim and oh, I had a nice San Rafael chat. I remember. Um, yeah. 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 I got pictures with you and yeah. I. Yeah. Hi, Aww. Rachel. Oh, I remember. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah. And um, so I wanted to follow up. I'd like to touch base with somebody about the chat room because I'm finding it kind of inaccessible and it might just be on my end. Well, let me and explain the point, like how the up. chat room works. And I will get you in touch with somebody. So send me. Here's what you should do. Send me an email. Uh, uh, probably the best way would be uh, leo at leoville.com. That's my personal email. Yep, yep. I've and, talked to your sister Eva a while ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She used to answer all my mail. Uh, yeah. So uh, I will then connect you with one of our chat mods who's great, and, uh, uh, and uh, she'll help you figure it out. Uh, That'd be but awesome. It is, it is accessible, but I should explain the way the chat room is, it works. Is it, It's not my thing. We pay right. for a server, but it's really a community project. People who follow the shows and who are enthusiasts, and so it's self-moderated. They moderate it. I don't set the rules. I don't. I you know I'm there, but I don't. I'm just another member of the community in that chat room. So, mm -hmm. but it is using a technology called IRC, which is the right it's, oh, predates the World Wide Web. I mean, it is. Yeah, an old, I'm familiar with it. I guess I'm just not very good at it. <laughs> well, you, you need what you'll need is an IRC. You can do it in the mm -hmm. web. And if you just go in your browser to irc.twit.tv, you'll be able to do it. But it may not be as accessible as you'd like. And so what you yeah, need I is... I want to hang out in the back of the class, you know? Yeah, you need a fully accessible <laughs> IRC client. And I'm sure yeah. I'll, I'll hook you up with Oznet, and I'm sure she can figure out which... That'd be awesome. ...which of the those other, would work best for you. That'd be awesome. Um, and the other follow-up was to the gentleman that you talked to yesterday. Um, I was... I figured you probably didn't have his number, but if he wants to contact... Uh, Kim, I'm happy to give my number and see if there's some way I can help him because I actually um, do use the BARD service, uh, which is the talking book service on Internet Explorer 11, and it does work. He uh, was uh, using the Library of Congress uh, books, right. audio yeah, books, that's what it is. and he said that IE 11 couldn't listen to them. And, and so it, that's what I suspected. If you use BARD, that might solve that problem. Well, actually, I, I mean, I... Uh, okay, then. Okay, honey. <laughs> Somebody wants mom's attention. <laughs> yes, yes. And it ain't your guide dog. <laughs> uh, right, right. This kid is so smart. She's three, and she oh. orders my Uber vehicles on my oh. Amazon device. Isn't that amazing nowadays? And scary. <laughs> I wonder how her generation is just going to have a completely different relationship with technology. It's very interesting. Say hi, Leo. Say hi, to Leo. Hi, Leo. Hi. What's your name? What's your name? My name is Delaney, Leo. Delaney, you sound so smart for three. She's three? <laughs> yes, yeah, she's three. She's beautifully eloquent. Yeah. Holy she is. Cow. You, I'm impressed. Awesome. I'm kind of proud of her, though. You ought to be. Wow. She's a pet girl. She gets my computer with jaws and starts, you know, hitting the letters. She's, she she's going to be, be, she's gonna be very, she's gonna be very yeah. literate. That's really exciting. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm happy to um, help that. All right, enough. A minute, baby. I'm happy to help this gentleman out if he wants to call Excellent. him and leave a number. Excellent. Um, so I'm call call back. I don't remember his name, but call back, and we will hook you up with uh, with Rachel, and she can walk you through. This is what's so great. I mean, this is what community means. We, we really help each other. She can help walk you through using Absolutely. the Bard. Do you use the application, or you you, know, you use it in IE11? 
I use everything. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's part of my job is to do technology. So I use everything, but I download them on IE 11, transfer them to an SD card to another device, or I'll use the application. Um, so I, I do it all. Excellent. <laughs> Well, I, I really appreciate your help, Rachel, and I love Absolutely. Delaney. I hope you'll come back and see us. Next time I get a dog, I will be and, there. <laughs> all right. I hope you'll bring Delaney. She sounds adorable. I absolutely will. Right. Thank and, you, And uh, I'll email you as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I will uh, I will uh, send along uh, the information you need. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Anytime. Yep. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that nice? Uh, th you know, this is what we need in this country, in this world. Forget the country. This is what we need in the world is a community of people who help each other out, you know, neighbor to neighbor. I think we're, I think humans are extremely good at that. We tend to be so tribal, unfortunately, you know, sometimes that tribalism creates barriers and borders, but I think there's also a, a natural instinct to, uh, to share and help one another. Let's, that's, let's foster that. I like that. That's the thing I like. Let's be friends. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo. Sarah, Los Angeles is next. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Thanks for hanging on. What can I do for you? Um, my dad always listens to you on the radio, so I just wanted to say he just told me to um, listen, ask you a question that I have. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm traveling overseas in the summer, and I'm looking for an international cell phone plan. Yeah. Um, so tell me a couple of things. Oh, yeah. My daughter's overseas right now. She's in Budapest. She's going to Prague after this. She just got back from Israel. Where Where are you going, and how long are you going for? Um, well, I'm actually going to Israel also, and I'm going to Europe. Okay. Uh, for how long? Um, for a month. For a month. So multiple yes. countries in Europe. Um, Amsterdam, Italy, and France. Oh, how fun. Are you excited? <laughs> Very. Oh, man. Trip of a lifetime. Yeah. Just they, graduated, so. That's, they used to call this the grand tour, and every well-educated person was supposed to go in between high school and college on your grand tour. Now, <laughs> this is your grand tour. How exciting. Yeah. Yes, so there's a couple of things. You know, there's three things that you do with a smartphone. Phone calls is one, uh, obviously. Text messaging is another. And data is the third, the ability to surf the web or, more importantly, as you travel, get maps and locations and directions and that kind of thing. Maybe make restaurant reservations or re hotel reservations, that kind of thing. Stay in touch. So I think a smartphone is a really valuable device for travel, and I'm sure your dad... Just as I, I made sure my daughter had a, a good phone and was able to stay in touch because I want to make sure she's okay. Yeah. So who's your who's your cell phone provider right now? Verizon. Unfortunately, not the best for international travel for two reasons. One, many Verizon phones don't work well overseas because they, they use a technology that is usually only used in America called CDMA. I mean, you need a GSM phone. So that's problem number one. But many Verizon phones these days, like, I bet you have an iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. You're in good, good, hand, good luck because the iPhone uh, from Verizon is international. The other thing is Verizon's international plans are pricey. Now, this yeah. has changed a lot because uh, T-Mobile kind of kicked this all off by saying, you know what, we're not going to charge you for international data, and we're not going to charge you for international texting, and we're only going to charge you 20 cents a minute for international calling. So there. And when T-Mobile did that, Sprint said, oh, we could do that. And then AT&T said, okay. And then Verizon, too. All of them have lowered the cost of international data. Data is the thing that will really eat you alive. Uh, you're not going to make a lot of calls. Texting, if you start sending a lot of texts, if you t I bet you text a lot, right? Because your generation, yeah. yeah. Texting <laughs> could add up if you had to pay per text. So one solution is to get a phone from T-Mobile. But now your phone will work on T-Mobile. Here's the good news. Verizon with iPhones doesn't lock. You know you have that thing in there called a the SIM card, a little chip that's in the phone? Do you know about that? On the side. Yeah, yeah on, on the, the side. side. You could pop it out. So that chip is the phone's personality. It's your phone number. It says what network you're on. A Verizon phone is essentially unlocked on the SIM card. So that means you could pop it out. One, th one option you'd have is to go to T-Mobile and get a SIM just for that month. Another option you'd have is when you get to Europe, 
to replace the SIM in your phone with a local SIM. The nice thing about Europe, all the countries you're in, they have roaming agreements that means you buy one chip, say, is probably Holland's your first stop, right? In the Amsterdam? Um, Paris. Paris. Oh, have you ever been to Paris? No, my Oh. Are you you're going with a group? I'm going with a couple of my friends. Oh, you're going to the greatest city in the world. You're going to love it so much. Oh, I'm so <laughs> jealous. Ah, it's a very romantic city. It's a beautiful city. When you get to uh, the airport, you can mm -hmm. usually go to, there'll be little booths there, uh, sometimes there's vending machines, and get a, a French SIM card that has French data and will let you inexpensively get unlimited data for the month in France, Italy, and Holland. But it has one downside. It will change your phone number. You'll suddenly have an international phone number. Mm -hmm. Your old Verizon phone number is no longer functional once you take that SIM card out of the iPhone. So that is another option for you. I've got a third option that I really like. And this is what I did with my daughter. She has a T-Mobile phone. So I wasn't too worried about phone calls. They're not expensive. Uh, texting, it's unlimited international. I wasn't worried about that. But data can use them very fast on, on T-Mobile internationally. So I got her a little my, it's I call them MiFi's. It's a little Wi-Fi dongle that uses international LTE and 4G for its connection. And then you join it with your phone via Wi-Fi. So you don't have to change your phone number. You get unlimited data. You get it fairly cheaply. Now, what I have may be more than your dad wants to spend or you want to spend, but I'll, I'm going to tell you about it anyway. Uh, this is what Abby brought with her, my daughter uh, brought with her. It is a, uh, inter it's a kind of an orange puck, <laughs> about the size of a hockey puck, for international data. And, uh, oh, what's it called now? I'm just, I'm just drew a blank on the name of it. I'll, it'll, chat room will tell me. But you buy this thing, it's a... It, 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 it only via Wi-Fi. You can keep it in your purse or pocket, and oh. uh, and then it's Wi-Fi to your phone. You turn now. This is key. You turn off international data, or actually, what it'll say on your iPhone is data roaming. Turn that off, because data roaming uh, lets you use the French cell phone network. You don't want to do that. That will be a lot of money. So turn off. You turn off data roaming on your phone. You join this puck. The Wi-Fi in the puck, and then as you wander around, it gets roaming, but it you don't have to pay for it. You, you pay a eight dollars a day or ninety nine dollars for the month, and you have unlimited data on that thing. And better yet, your three friends can share it with you. So get an all to chip in on it, and then you'll be in you'll be in great shape because you'll have. It's called the Skyroam, and I thank Tony in the chat room for reminding me. Thank you, Tony. I couldn't remember. Skyroam.com, and it'll work in all three of those countries. You'll buy it, or you can rent it, and you could split that cost among your friends, and then you pay 99 bucks for a month of unlimited data. Again, split that with your friends, because up to five people can use it at the same time. And then you'll still have your phone number. Texting, you should contact Verizon and see if you can get an international texting plan, because that'll save you money. But if you use, do you use WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, or, or you probably What's use that? Apple, yeah, and Apple Messages, those all use data. So you won't have to worry if you're using WhatsApp. That'll be using the Skyroam, not your cell phone. So you'll still be able to message with all your friends. You can Snapchat. All that stuff is data. Can you call from the Wi-Fi? Because I you, know WhatsApp. You can right? if you use WhatsApp to do it or Google's Hangouts or one of the or Skype. Yeah. Yeah, then you can call as well. Okay. And your your phone supports Wi-Fi calling, so uh, you probably probably be able to do that very easily. Actually, though, wait a minute. That will use minutes, and those minutes will be charged at the international rate. So you, it's certainly before you go, call Verizon and just make sure that you understand what the rules are and what it's going to cost you. And they do have international plans, but their international data plan is expensive, and you don't get much data. So you'd be much better off using something like a Skyroam. Or when you get to Paris, they offer devices, same thing, there. And then you can all share it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So when you get to Paris, I had to take a break there for the commercial. When you get to Paris, you and your buddies can chip in on a rental. They'll have it at the airport. It's the same thing. The only nice thing about having the Skyrim is you've already got it. It's all set up. You know how it works, and you're ready to go. But if you're willing to take a little chance, and you're taking a big chance, this is, this is an adventure, isn't it? 
If you're, yep. if you're a little bit of an adventure, when you get to Paris, you can get a device that will be like the Skyrim. It'll be cheaper that you'll just use in Europe. And you and your friends can split it three ways. That way you won't have too much expense. What I would recommend, there is a very good website that'll tell you about this. If you Google prepaid with data, it's a, it's a prepaid with data. It's a wiki that has that everybody who travels puts the information up there about how to solve this exact problem. Got it. And they will tell you what you can get in France that will work in all the countries you're going to visit, how much it'll cost. They will say, this one's better than that one, all of that. So you're looking at, uh, I think they call it mobile internet. What do they call it? You, you want, uh, it's like a MiFi. They call them MiFi's, mobile hotspots. That's what you want. So you can read about mobile hotspots. And you can rent one there at the airport that you give back when you fly out of the, you're going to probably fly out of Italy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could give back that. Okay. Hey, you're going to have a great time. When do you leave? Um, July 23rd. Soon. Are you, ex yeah. are you excited? <laughs> One month. Very. <laughs> oh, the best trip ever. And you know what? Dad, congratulations, Dad, because that's a brave thing to do. Like, put your daughter on a plane and say, bye-bye, have fun. <laughs> I'll see you in a month. Ah. Yeah. I remember the first time I did that. Abby is quite the traveler. So the first time I did that, she was a junior in high school. She went to France for a year. Man, was I... Went school? Yeah, she or... went to high school in France for a year. I was crying when she left. Oh, wow. I know. I don't think I could do that. No, no, don't. You break your father's heart. So you going to college in the fall or what? Um, I actually just graduated from UCLA. Oh, you graduated from college. Yeah, that's when actually... Yeah, college. That's when you're supposed to do the grand tour is after you graduate from college. Good for you. So you're coming back and getting yeah. a job is what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully in the medical field. Nice. Do you want to go to medical school? Um, physician assistant. Very nice. Good. Yeah. Hey, have a wonderful trip. Thank you. Thank you for all your help. Oh, you're welcome. Have fun. Thank you. Bye, Sarah. Bye. Yeah, Abby went to Israel. Then she flew to Budapest. I think she's in Budapest right now. Then she goes to Prague, and then she comes home. She's with a friend, and I gave her my Skyrim. Thank you, Tony, for... I don't know why I couldn't remember that. I gave her my Skyrim, so, and I paid for a month of unlimited data. The Skyrim worked great. We went... Uh, we took it with us to Japan. It worked great, and we're going to take it... Our next trip, we go to five different European countries, including uh, Morocco. So we're going to Spain, Portugal, Italy, France, Malta, and Morocco. And this will be an interesting test. And Monaco, six. Monaco, <laughs> it doesn't really matter because Monaco is literally only a square mile. But for some reason, Google Fi does not uh, give you free service in Monaco. But you could pretty much, you're practically in France, so it wasn't a big deal. The Tech Guy Podcast brought to you today by Texture. I love Texture. Texture is a great app for your iPad or your smartphone, Android or iOS. It's kind of like, best way to think of it, Netflix for magazines. You pay one low monthly fee, less than $10 a month, and you get more than 200 of the best magazines in the nation. Great reading. You don't have to go to the newsstand and pick up a stack of dead trees. You don't have to subscribe for huge amounts of money. And your coffee table doesn't have to buckle under the load. You've got them all. Every page in every newsstand issue of every uh, magazine, plus back issues, plus bonus features you can't get in print, like video. If you love photography, National Geographic and Shutterbug, the images there are so much better, frankly. On the screen, you can you can even zoom in and really pixel peep. It's great for that. It's great for reading some of the best journalism in the nation, in the New Yorker, in the Atlantic. Uh, I love reading the gossips, the People magazine. It's always fun. This way, you, no embarrassment. You don't have to hide behind the grocery stand and <laughs> catch up on what's going on with Gwen and Blake and all that. No, I can just read it in my uh, texture. Nobody will even know. Uh, I, I love texture. Sports Illustrated. It's all in there. 300 years ago, when the magazine was invented, it was the latest in new technology. Fast forward to today, 
It's Texture. If you want to try it free, you can. A seven-day free trial awaits at texture.com slash twit. Texture is the magazine app. Unlimited access to 200 of the best magazines all in one place. Complete issues, back issues, anytime, anywhere, all in one app. Stay connected to the biggest and best stories of the day with Texture. To start your seven-day free trial, go to texture.com slash twit. And by the way, their curated sections are great because if you don't know what to read, they make suggestions by category just for you. It's a great way to keep up with the world. And by the way, great fiction, too. Let's not forget that. New Yorker has great stories. I'm a big fan. Texture.com slash twit. Enjoy. Sandy, Lomita, California is next. Hi, Sandy. Oh, hi. Um, I'm trying to be able to watch uh, my laptop on the television. Watch the so, laptop on the television. Okay. Or the computer, I guess. <laughs> well, is it is it that you? Uh, what is it that you want to watch on the television? Is it TV and video from your laptop? To be able to watch YouTube. Yeah. Or sometimes I, I have access to um, European movies, yeah. uh, European television, so I like to watch yeah. that on there because yeah. I don't want to sit in front of the laptop. It's yeah. small. So there's a couple of ways so, to do that. Most laptops have these days an HDMI port, so you could just connect it directly to your TV. But that's the least... Easy, which, which, which I have done. I'm connected, and I can view everything on my laptop on the television. And I'm trying to. I have what's on here is Intel ProSet Wireless Tools. That's up on my TV screen, so I I can run my computer on the television. I just cannot access the internet. It's really strange. I have, um, I think it's called Airport as my router. Yeah. Or okay, I have that. And then I have my modem, which is through AT&T. I have unplugged the, uh, the router, left it off for 10 seconds. I've also uh, unplugged the modem and left that off for 10 seconds. Well, well, hold on just a second. So you're saying that your laptop has internet just fine until you connect it to the TV and then it disappears? Yeah. And then also I will take my laptop to the office to work and that's wireless and I can, I can uh, hook up there too. Or I have connection at work also. It's just not at home. <laughs> but it works at home in every other respect. Just as soon as you plug in that HDMI cable, it stops working. Okay. When I have the laptop on the Internet, I am hardwired. Then I have my Ether. Ah, Ether so you don't use Wi-Fi on your laptop at home? No, but I do have the tablet for Wi-Fi. And then if my daughter is okay. here, okay. I think she's okay. able okay. to so, do so, Slow down. Slow down. Okay. So you're using an airport, an Apple airport, right? Yes. Yeah, well, that's Wi-Fi. And your laptop has Wi-Fi, I'm sure. So you yes. don't you don't need to connect via Ethernet to your laptop. No. No. So, well, if it's on the television, but the Ethernet cable is <laughs> not long enough. No, but you don't need to. To un eliminate the Ethernet cable entirely. Okay. And use your laptop's Wi-Fi to connect to your Internet. Yes. Now, how do I do that? Same way you do it at the, do you do it at the office, or do you know you've never used Wi-Fi with your laptop? No, just at the office. And then when I had trouble with that, I just had my office. Yeah, have him set it up. <laughs> so, what is it? A, it's an Apple laptop. No, it's a it's a Sony Vio. Okay, so on Windows, uh, yep. there is in the lower right hand corner, you know those little tiny icons down there. One of the icons is uh, is a, a network icon, a Wi-Fi icon. And unless that laptop, well, no, but you, I know you has Wi-Fi because you've used it at office. So what you need yeah. to do is click that little icon and your airport, whatever its name is, should show up there. Now, I bet no one ever told you the password to your airport. No, but I do have it. <laughs> I asked my daughter and I have been plugging that in. Okay, you don't, right you, don't need it. you don't need to use Ethernet is what I'm saying. Stop using Ethernet. Just start using Wi-Fi. Right, that's what I would like to do. Yeah, so that's a question of setting up the Sony to yeah. use the airport. And if you know the password and you know the name of the airport, it might just say airport, I don't know what it says, but if you know the name of the Wi-Fi access point, select it down there in the lower right-hand corner in that system tray. Make sure Wi-Fi is turned on. Sometimes on laptops there's a button to turn off Wi-Fi, airport mode, airplane mode. Make sure it's not in airplane mode. Okay. You'll see all of that in the lower right-hand corner. If you click 
one of those little icons. There's a battery icon, there's a mixer icon, and there might be one that looks like it's got little sound waves coming out of a dot. That's the Wi-Fi icon. Okay, I also have, they look like bars for the telephone. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, click, so click, right now, click those. Okay, I've, I've clicked that, and so then it wants me to enter the network security key, which yeah. I have. Yeah. That's what we were speaking yeah. of. So select, you need to select the, the name of the airport, whatever that is. Your daughter may have named it airport, <laughs> but, it, but it has a name. Uh, your daughter should tell you what that name is. And then it'll say, okay, if you want to connect to that, you need to know the key. That's the password. That's all it is. That's, yeah, and that's what I've been doing. And it won't join it. No, and right now it just comes up. It says Windows when it was unable to connect to her network. So that's the wrong password. I asked her, and she said, no, that's it. Well, she, <laughs> it's, you're, it's the same one I've I, used to um, do the tablet, too. Oh. But it, so, won't, it won't join it, huh? And no. then, and then, okay. So you—that's why you've been using the, the wired cable, the Ethernet cable. Yes. Uh, it truthfully, it sh if you now you uh, did you say that you can't reach the Ethernet cable over to the TV? Is that the problem? Right. That the Ethernet cable so, is only like six feet. So that's why you lose internet when you connect to the TV. You're disconnecting the Ethernet cable. That's right. Oh, oh. Well, that all makes sense now. Yeah. <laughs> So either, okay, so you have a few choices. You can get a longer cable. You can figure out why you can't join the Wi-Fi, uh, your, your daughter's Wi-Fi, and it, it, it may be you're not joining the right thing. Make sure you look at it on the tablet and see what the name is on the tablet and, you know, use that same password. It should work just like it does on the tablet on the, on the uh, Sony. Yeah, this is why I'm, I'm just totally confused. And then I have other Windows that I've opened up a manual diagnostics tool. No, no, you don't need all, it's not that complicated. <laughs> You're making it more complicated. It's not that complicated. Make sure your caps lock key isn't on, things like that. Well, I just checked. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Type the password into a text window and then paste it in. Somehow, we got to make sure that it's the right password and it's the right access point. you got to choose the right access point. If that still doesn't work... Yeah. Uh, then there is another way you can wirelessly connect to the TV. So, okay. so you can, and actually this would be the easiest way because then you could sit in the couch with your laptop on your lap and, <laughs> and broadcast to the TV whatever you want to see. Does, yes. does your daughter, she's, she's got an airport, I, bet, I wonder if she has an Apple TV. Does she happen to have an Apple TV? No, no, she doesn't have an Apple TV. She okay. just has a MacBook, a MacBook Pro. Yeah, right. But she's, okay. not, she's not in the house here now. She's down yeah. in... No, that's fine. Diego. Um, so there are various ways. It depends on the TV. Sometimes TVs have built in the ability to stream to them wirelessly. Oh, but wait a minute. <laughs> Never mind. Because you're not on the Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. So even know. that is not going to work. We need to somehow, either you get a longer cable <laughs> so that you can keep it plugged in. I see. Yeah, that's why you lost the internet. You unplugged the cable, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, well, I wish you'd told me that. It would have saved. <laughs> yeah. Oh, of course you lost the Wi-Fi. So what, the, the internet. So what you need, to, I think really what you want to do is get Wi-Fi working because then everything will just work. You put the laptop next to the TV, you plug in the HDMI cable and it'll work. Um, yeah. So we, we want to get your Wi-Fi working on that Sony. We know Wi-Fi works on it because it works at your office. Yes, and I'm uh, and I'm just you know you, you you I guess the more complete way to do this would be to go into the network control panel. Okay. And uh, I know that's not this is not fun, but uh, if you if you open the control panel, you can look, look go to the network and sharing center, and you can set up a new connection, and you can you 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 know, step by step go through this. Probably this is what your IT guy did. You, you want to get that Wi-Fi working. And, uh, and since you're able to join the Wi-Fi with your tablet yes, and you have that password, there's something there. There's some simple thing that we're overlooking that just, you know, is a question of <laughs> typing the right password, getting the, you know, turning off the caps lock or the scroll lock key or making sure you're joining the actual access point. Uh, it's probably not named airport, but who knows? It might be. But you should be able to get that. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You know, but check, make sure you're using 
O's and zeros, not, you know, sometimes L's and ones and O's and zeros can be confused. There's all sorts of oddball things. And maybe you could, at worst case, you get your daughter to change the password. I think if I think the first thing you need to do is log in to the Wi-Fi. That's then you'd have Wi-Fi. You wouldn't have to be sit connected to that silly Ethernet cable the whole time. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy, episode fifteen hundred, almost done. Last segment. We go on to the second fifteen hundred <laughs> next time. Uh, back to the phones we go. Matt in Rochester, Minnesota. Oh. Hello, Matt. Okay. Hey, Leo. How are you? I am very well. How are you? Home of the Mayo Clinic, yeah, really, right? Home of the Mayo Clinic, you betcha, and uh, big IBM campus down That's there. right. That's right, yeah. What can but I do no, for you? I'm really excited to talk to you. Thank First you. First time caller here. Welcome. Uh, so excited. We're building a brand new house here, and I'm doing all the low-voltage wiring, so all the Cat5 I ran throughout the house. Good man. And just wondering, what's the best system that I can get I know there's all these mesh networking systems out for wireless, but if I've got the ability to wire in, would something like the Eero or the Google Wi-Fi still work well to direct hardwire in as nodes to extend my signal out? Or yeah, so I got a great solution uh, for you. Eero's a sponsor, mm -hmm. and I use Eero at home. I don't like Google's Wi-Fi solution. I don't think it's among the best mesh solutions. Mm -hmm. There is a solution, though, uh, and I also use this at home, that is really interesting for specifically your application. And it's called mm -hmm. Plume, P-L-U-M-E. And w what they sell is little, tiny little uh, uh, points that plug into the wall. But they all have an Ethernet port. And the reason they have an sure. Ethernet port is exactly as you say, because you've got Ethernet in your room. You plug it into the plume. Each You're still part of a larger mesh. So mm -hmm. it's not like you have different access points in every room, but you have very localized 5G access in that room from your Ethernet into that plume. So uh, this is a for your specific unusual situation, this is exactly yep. the right way to do it. Uh, that way, you make these little pools of Wi-Fi. Each you, you know, this drawback is it might be a little more expensive because you're going to get a plume for each yeah. room, right? But you're going to get yep. superb Wi-Fi that way. So is it is it doing the handover if you're walking around yes. the house? You've got yes. the iPad. Sit yeah. down. It's still a true and mesh what's system. The coverage? Well, it's whatever you give it. On it really good. To, well, what about if you want to get a signal outside? In that case, the Plume makes a larger, they just released this larger, Plume got a big investment from Comcast. If you get Xfinity, mm -hmm. the X5 that you get will be little Plume devices. They make a larger sure. tri-band one now that would be probably the one you'd use for the outside access. The theory mm -hmm. of Plume, and the reason I like it, is it is, it is limited. They want to make a little pool of Wi-Fi that reduces interference from the neighbors and everything else. So that's why you want one in every room. But if you want it outside, mm -hmm. then get the newer plume, the larger tri-band, and put that near the window or nearest wherever you're going to be outside. Yeah, and That'll be fine. I actually use the plume network as my IoT network because I want to keep my Internet of Things devices separated from my uh, home, home network. So my outdoor yep. cameras, all of that stuff, all is on the plume. But the, the beauty so of that is... You create separate networks with that like a guest network yes. or internet of things because i'm looking at yes. getting like a wi-fi enabled lawnmower one of the things that plume does that's really interesting is they have three levels of wi-fi built in one of them gives you internet access with no access to the rest of the network exactly yeah. what you're looking for for security yeah. on internet of things so it uh, it's of all of them it's the most interesting in terms of of that it gives you it gives you um uh, kind of a whoops! I just closed it. I was going to show people who are watching the video uh, that you can have an internet-only Wi-Fi connection that doesn't access. You can have a guest connection that that has more capabilities, could access TVs and stuff, yep. and then the home connection has all access, and that gives you full access to everything. So I'm a I'm a fan of this uh, system. It's an interesting system. Uh, the if you buy the pods, they call them pods. Uh, they're mm -hmm. less expensive than, say, the Eero beacons, the extenders for the Eero. Mm -hmm. 
I, I can't remember what the price is if you buy them in quantity. But remember, you'll have to buy more than you would with the Eero. With the Eero, each unit covers 1,500 square feet. So sure. uh, for outside access, the Eero is great. But if, if you have – but what the Eero doesn't support with these beacons is this idea of connecting the Ethernet in, the, in that room into it to give it the backhaul. And I love the idea. So Eero, Plumes will use your Internet as a backhaul but still be a mm -hmm. unified network. So do you have any opinion, like, on the ubiquity systems? For well, that's, kind of now, nodes or you're a geek. Enterprise? Yeah, you're a geek. You did your own wiring. Ubiquity, uh, I don't like their consumer stuff mm -hmm. very much. I don't think that their attempt to compete with Eero is very good. But the enterprise-grade stuff is marvelous, you know, but it requires some sophistication, not only to set up, but to maintain. They used to have a yeah. standalone Java app that you had to use. That has changed. They're a little bit better than they used to be. But but they're like many enterprise solutions. They don't make any concessions to normal people. They expect you mm -hmm. to be an IT professional. If you feel yeah, comfortable. Had, with it, it seemed like a pretty expensive system to go with the enterprise version. It is. Yeah, yeah it is. And we, a lot of parts. It wasn't just buy the node. No, you have to buy a base unit. With yep. It. Yep. yep. Ruckus is like that. That's what we use in our studios. Mm -hmm. I think Eero, really, the idea of Eero uh, was to bring that kind of mesh home to the consumer with, with consumer interface, you know, an app and all of that stuff. You know, since then, Ubiquity's tried with their Amplify system, but I don't find the Amplify very good. Mm -hmm. My the, the three I like the best, Eero is number one. That's what I use at home. Plume is mm -hmm. great for your specific situation, uh, mm -hmm. making little pools of Wi-Fi to eliminate interference. And then for raw speed, nothing beats Netgear's uh, uh, Ubiquity. Not uh, Ubiquity. Um, uh, oh, Netgear makes their own. Uh, I've forgotten the name. It'll come to me in a second. But uh, they have also a, a mesh system that uh, I think is, is the, the speediest of them out there. Uh, Orbi, O R B I. Okay, but that's uh, maybe not ideal for what you want to do because there's Orbi uses fewer satellites. What you want to do because mm -hmm. you've got Ethernet drops in every room is have something that can connect to the Ethernet. Yep, Plume's the only one I know of that does that. So perfect. Okay, Leo, thanks so oh, much. Somebody's telling me that the Deco has a hard line backhaul as well. Now I haven't tried uh, the Deco mesh. That is, uh, that's the... Who makes, is that the name brand, or who makes that? Um, uh, it's made by, is it Linksys? It's made by a big, uh, well-known company. Um, but okay. But, uh, well, let, me, let me look it up here, because I can't remember off the top of my head. And I haven't tried these yet. TP-Link does it. Um, so, TP-Link, I'm not surprised. They're, they're also very geeky, and so they have a mm -hmm. backhaul as well. That's what you're looking for, is a okay. wired backhaul. That's, that's what I would look for. Sure. Thanks, hey, Leo. My pleasure. You're lucky. Anytime anybody's got hard wire in the walls, that's the best. Ethernet is fastest, less interference, no neighbors can, in, you know, it's more secure. All of that's the best. But it's not as convenient, frankly, as wireless. So I, I you know, I think kind of mixing the two together is kind of an interesting idea. A little hard wire, a little wireless. Our sponsors make it all free to you, including the website, techguylabs.com. No sign up there, no fee. But everything we talk about links to all of this. In fact, all of those uh, solutions I just mentioned, the mesh wire, uh, Wi-Fi systems, uh, all up there, techilabs.com. And, uh, and it goes all the way back, 1,500 episodes. 1,501 coming up next week. Thanks to Michael Cozio. He's been spinning the discs today, making some great music for us all, our musical director. Thanks also to Kim Schaffer for bringing you on the air, answering our phone calls. Most of all, thanks to you for being here. We're a great tech community, aren't we? Thank you for being part of it. And I'll see you next time. Leo Laporte, The Tech Guy. Have a great Geek Week. Well, that's it for The Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech. And you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on. And on. And of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon this week in tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.